so long as um, Chris is it easy doing this? You're live. We are live. Oh, okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Councillor Smart, and I'm the chair of this committee. I'd like to welcome you all to Cambridge City Council's planning committee meeting taking place at 10 a.m. on the 7th of September. Other members of this committee, I'll let them introduce themselves, are going from Rob on my right here. Try to introduce yourself in the microphone, Rob. I'm City Council of Cherry Hindley Ward. Tim Thornborough, Petersfield Ward. Uh, Councillor Jenny Gawthrop Wood, Kings Hedges Ward, Camp City Councillor. Councillor Katie Porro, Market Ward. Uh, Councillor Pagecroft, uh, Queen Edith Ward. Abby Ward. Thanks, everyone. Sorry about that, Jennifer. Uh, maybe it's need to be fixed now, but you can hear okay, can you? Yeah, I can hear. Um, right. Uh, and the officers permanently disabled this meeting are uh, Area Development Manager Toby Williams, Legal Advisor Keith Barber, Committee Manager James Goddard, and Producer Chris Connor. Um, also. Other officers and public speakers will join us throughout the course of the meeting. I will introduce them at the start of relevant agenda items. <coughs> Housekeeping. Copies of the agenda can be found on the City Council's website under committee meetings, minutes and agendas. Please try and refer to specific page numbers within the agenda if you're referring to a specific paragraph or plan. And also it'd be useful to say the item number as well so that people on computers can understand where to go. Can I remind all of those present of the importance of using the microphones at all times when speaking? Please speak close to and clearly into the microphone. Please ensure you're switched off or silenced any other devices you have so that they do not interrupt the proceedings. When you are invited to address the meeting, please make sure your microphone is switched on. When you finish addressing the meeting, please turn off your microphone immediately. Speak slowly and clearly and please do not talk over or, or interrupt anyone. If anyone has any problems hearing me throughout the meeting, please alert me by waving their hands or advising a council officer. We aim to take a 30 minute lunch break between noon and 2 p.m. Uh, so that's sometime between those times. Please can those present in the council chamber note that everything on your desk, including your laptop screen, is likely to be broadcast at some point. The camera follows the microphone being switched on, so councillors and officers are requested to wait a couple of seconds before speaking to allow the camera to catch up. Please raise your hand if you wish to speak. Please can those participating in the meeting via the live stream indicate that you, you wish to speak via the chat column or raised hand option. Please do not use the chat column for any other purpose. The meeting chat is neither confidential nor private and can be, can be subject to an FR, FOI stroke DPA request, that's Freedom of Information, or, uh, this gets me that one, I've forgotten. I'll come back to it. Make sure that your device is fully charged and that you switch your microphone off unless you are invited to speak. Please use a headset if available when speaking and hold the microphone close to your mouth. For public speakers, turn their cameras off until we come to the application we have registered you to speak about. Uh, if a report officer drops out from the committee due to floor broadband signal, <clears throat> the senior officer present will take over their presentation or report and respond to questions. The case officer will give a brief introduction to his or her report. Registered public speakers will be invited to have their say. There will be three minutes for those speaking in support and three minutes for those speaking against, unless I have advised otherwise. The committee manager will ring a bell when you have 30 seconds remaining. <clears throat> Excuse me. Once public speakers have addressed the committee, their speaking time is over. Public speakers are unable to join in with the councillor debate, and that includes in the chat column as well online. The committee will then discuss and debate the item and may ask questions of the case officer. At the end of the de deliberation, I will ask members to vote on the officer recommendation by a show of hands. 
The Council has a convention for major planning applications known as the Adjourned Decision Protocol. Where there is a majority resolution, it is minded to make a decision contrary to the officer recommendation. The decision to determine the application will then be adjourned and the officers will re prepare a further report which will come back to a future meeting of this committee. Only those present in the chamber can vote or propose a or second recommendations. For the comfort of councillors, officers and the public, I may choose to call short breaks during the proceedings. If councillors or officers require a break at any point, please indicate to me and I will halt the proceedings at the next convenient opportunity. <clears throat> to agenda item three, please can councillors declare if they have... Oh, hang on a minute. Um, I missed one of them. Uh, apologies. So apologies I've got are Councillor Bajant and Councillor Collis. I think that's it, isn't it? One, two, three, four, six, seven. Yeah, I think so. That's it. Um, and we don't have anyone standing in for them. Uh, so agenda item three, any declarations of interest, Councillors? Councillor Bennett. Item 11, I'd like to be excused as I'm a very close neighbour. It's your prerogative, Councillor, to do what you will, but you don't have to stand away from committee because you're a neighbour of an item, but that's your prerogative. You can always have a chat with the legal officer before we get to that stage, if you wish. Any more? Councillor Pora. Thank you, Chair. For item nine, the prospect row, I will remove myself from the debate as I um, know the owner and have been involved in pre-app. And just to note that item 13, which is the tree works, I've been contacted by... Uh, interested party, but I'd refer them on to the tree officer, so I'm unfettered in my discretion. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Goldthorpe Wood. Um, item, yeah, item seven. Now, I do know uh, one of the residents in Sewers Road who has talked about previous planning applications, uh, I think, at this address, but I, I am unfettered. So, any more? No, that's it. Okay. So, uh, agenda item four. There are no minutes of previous meetings submitted for this meeting for approval. So, those will come to a further meeting. And um, so, the first item is locked in house. But before we do that, um, Toby wants to have a few words about the agenda today. Toby. Thanks, Chair. Um, there are two items that made it onto the agenda. Items 8, the Shah Jalal Mosque, and item 10, the Cambridge Snooker and Pool Centre. Unfortunately, there um, are issues with the description of development for both those items. For item 8, the applicants have agreed to um, withdraw this item from the committee to amend a description. Um, a discrepancy in the description of development. So officers are asking that members agree to um, withdraw their consideration of that item for this committee. And for item 10, unfortunately, there is an error in the description of development that has been picked up late. It is a fundamental error in my view and goes to the heart of the decision. So officers are recommending that, that is withdrawn and the description of development um, amended in agreement with the applicants. The applicants for that um, application are also aware of the issue. So officers are asking members to um, determine that both these items are withdrawn from consideration. Thanks, Toby. So I support officers in that um, suggestion to remove them from the agenda. Anyone got anything else to say different about that? No? Okay, that's what we'll do then. In that case, we'll go to item five, Lockton House, the first and only major planning application of the day. Um, Alice Young, you're the case officer. Looks like you're there on the screen. And um, we've got one speaker, Oliver Unwin, the architect. It looks to me like the objector's not speaking for this item. In that case. So, um, Alice, when you're ready, can you present the item then, please? Thank you, Chair. Let me just share my screen. Oh, 
hang on a second, bear with me. Can I just confirm that you can see my screen? Thank you, Chair. So the application is um, a Section 73 application at Lockton House to vary condition to the approved plans on the full uh, consent. The full consent um, description of development is uh, the demolition of Lockton House, one and two Brooklands Avenue and replacement for the of the two new buildings comprises office use, flexible commercial space to include a cafe, ground floor, uh, underground car parking and utilities, erection of a covered walkway, electricity substation, bin stores, access, cycle parking and associated hard and soft landscaping. The section 73 um, seeks to retain the gable wall of one and two Brooklands Avenue um, and associated alterations to the form and appearance of building A replacing Brooklands Avenue, installation of PV panels on building A and B, air handling plant decks on building A and ventilation screen to ramped vehicle entrance to building B to meet the net zero carbon aspirations, fenestration changes and other minor material amendments. So um, you will have seen on the amendment sheet there um, has been an update. Um, I have updated the relevant site history to include the EIA screening opinion um, given for the site. Apologies, this was missed um, from the report. Um, the EIA screening concluded that the development was not EIA development and therefore an EIA screening was not required. Officers have considered the Section 73 changes and conclude that this does not alter the outcome of this assessment. A further screening is not required and no significant environmental impacts would arise from the development. So the site, I'm sure you're familiar with the site, but I'll just go through the constraints, etc. So the site is south of Brooklands Avenue and east of Clarendon Road, with part of the site falling within the Brooklands Avenue um, conservation area. Um, you'll see on this um, location plan to the right of the screen that um, this is the uh, conservation area boundary which goes through the site um, and cuts through the site south of uh, 1 2 Brooklands Avenue um, and then skirts the site boundary to the west. Um, grade 2 listed um, Royal Albert Homes sit opposite the, the 1 to 2 Brooklands Avenue and a row of Leandai trees um, which are protected um, by a TPO along the southern boundary. The site lies within the controlled parking zone and within the Cambridge Airport consultation zone. Uh, to the west of the site um, are Brooklands um, Avenue properties. These are a mix of commercial and residential units um, within the attached terrace. Um, to the east is City um, and Unex House, a three-storey commercial office. Um, the built form is separated here by vehicular access and street level car parking. To the north and west of the L-shaped site fronting Clarendon Road are several residential townhouses here. The site um, formerly consisted of Lockton House, um, just here. Um, and 1 to 2 Brooklands Avenue, uh, which fronted Brooklands Avenue. Lockton House was a 1960s six storey office block um, that was sited to the southern section of the site, accessed of Clarendon Road. Uh, 1 to 2 Brooklands Avenue is an end of terrace Victorian um, office building accessed off Brooklands Avenue. Both Lockton House and the majority of 1 to 2 Brooklands Avenue, aside from the gable wall, um, has been currently demolished um, as permitted under the full application. Uh, this is shown on this imagery here.
So the section 73 seeks to vary the approved plans um, to retain the gable wall of one to two Brooklyn's Avenue um, and associated alterations to the form and appearance of building A, including a change in roof form, fenestration and dormer details to building A, the installation of PV panels to building A and B, air handling plant decks to um, building A, a ventilation screen to the ramped vehicle entrance to building B and a reduction in the size of the substation and a gantry on building B. So the, the previous application was approved at planning committee on the 21st of April. Uh, since this approval, the development um, team has been in extensive conversation with the owners of the adjacent house, uh, adjacent site, city house and Unix house to enable access to carry out the approved development. Unfortunately, access to city and Unix house um, for the safe demolition of the gable end of one to two Brooklyn's Avenue has been denied multiple times and the owners have stated that um, no level of compensation would alter this um, outcome. The applicant has explored other ways to demolish um, the gable within the site. However, this was not fruitful um, and every legal action has been explored to um, build the approved plans of the full consent. Um, therefore, the applicants have worked with the City Council's planning and conservation team um, to create a scheme which retains the gable end. Alongside the retention of the gable end, um, and the subsequent design alterations. The section 73 also includes alterations to the design to improve energy performance and operational carbon emissions to meet the net zero carbon aspirations of the development. As I said um, previously, uh, the original full application has been implemented and works have progressed. Lockton House and 1 to 2 Brooklyn Avenue have been demolished aside from the gable wall and the capping beams to building B to the rear of the site are being formed. Um, excavation of the basement um, car parking will start mid-September um, with building B rapidly progressing and emerging out of the ground um, during the autumn in accordance with the approved full application. So I'll just go through the uh, proposed plans. Um, I've highlighted um, circled in yellow the changes and um, you'll see that the um, retained gable wall is here and so the built form is actually closer to the um, eastern boundary. Um, the substation has been reduced um, in size and increased levels of um, visitor car parking and then the WCs um, internally have been reconfigured so there's no change to the basement plan. Again, this um, shows the retained uh, gable and the visitor and substation. And again, the gable here, changes to the fenestration to accommodate the changes to the gable. Uh, changes to the roof form on the second floor plan, um, the addition of uh, solar panels, and plant uh, deck on building A, and then um, addition of solar panels on building B. Uh, again, solar panels on, on block A here, um, and then a plant deck here within the um, pitched gables. Fourth plan, aside from the previous changes mentioned, is broadly the same. And then um, on the roof plan, there's additional PV um, on building B alongside a, a gantry and plant deck here. So I've also um, highlighted the um, elevational changes. Um, so increase in, in ridge and eaves heights um, compared to the full application. Um, Changes to the, the, the dormer, um, this is switched, it, it was on this side, um, but it's now towards the right and um, closer to the um, existing terrace. And then this window here 
as well as being reverted has also been enlarged. Um, the colonnade entrance still remains um, to the right on this elevation. So um, this is the eastern elevation. You'll see the retained gable um, wall here, a linking flat roof section to the uh, approved gables. And this here is a um, screening for the plant deck. This is the southern elevation of building A. This is um, the proposed EV, um, PV panels, sorry. And this is the western elevation. You'll see, obviously, the retained gable, um, flat roof section, screening here. And then um, there's been a slight change to the number of voids along here to the colonnade. Um, this has been reduced to two, um, and there used to be one here adjacent to three Brooklands Avenue. So the sections will show the the plant decks a bit in a bit more detail. Um, you'll see that there's one one here, and there's um, a concealed one within the the gables of the latter section of Building A as well. And that's illustrated through this section as well. So Building B, um, the north elevation, the main change, the only change is the addition of the gantry. Um, On, again, on the eastern elevation, it's it's the gantry again, which is an open structure with PV panels on, on the top and plants contained within um, the structure. Uh, the southern elevation um, is just PV panels here um, and then the, the gantry as well. And then lastly, the western elevation, PV panels and then the gantry here. This section shows the gantry in a bit more detail. There's a there's a plant deck um, hidden by the the um, existing gables, and then this open structure um, on top. So this is a whole site section, north to south, shows the uh, gable wall being retained um, on building A, and then the the gantry here on building B. And then this is a site section east to west. This is the plant deck for building A and then the gantry for building B. So the key planning considerations in, in this um, application, the section 73 application is the visual impact arising from the retain, retention of the um, gable alongside other um, changes, uh, the impact on the character and impact on the conservation area, um, the immunity impact and um, the sustainability. So um, we'll look at the, the visual impact um, of the changes on key views. So the Brooklands Avenue frontage, this is the Brooklands Avenue frontage. Um, you'll see here that there's been an increase in, in the ridge height. This is what I was mentioning earlier on the plans. Um, the ridge and eaves height and the change in roof form. Um, this is um, identical to what was there originally. Obviously, this building is now demolished. The um, change in the um, location of the dormer and then this window at first floor as well, see views um, through the site, um, through the colonnade. So given the proposal is maintaining the scale and massing of the original frontage and the terrace here um, that it is sited adjacent to has a varied ridge and eaves height, you'll see from this, um, this image here, um, the scale proposed is considered to be appropriate within its context. The fenestration and, and detailing now has, has flipped, as I've mentioned, um, with the dormer being on the right above the colonnade. Um, officers, including the conservation um, and design, urban design officers, consider that this still responds to the rhythm um, of the Brooklands Avenue Terrace, um, with the bay windows at regular interviews 
intervals um, punctuating the terrace. Um, and it acts as a contemporary um, counterpoint to the detailed um, Victorian terrace itself. It's considered to, um, in this view, uh, make a po positive contribution to the street scene and the character and appearance of the area while maintaining the aims of the original scheme um, to create a simple counterpoint to the terrace. So viewing the proposal from this corner location further east on Brooklands Avenue, the retained gable is more noticeable here. Um, you'll see here. Um, this is um, to the to the right hand side of the screen. This is the baseline view. This is basically um, what we would call the existing view. But obviously these buildings have now been um, demolished or partially demolished in, in terms of one to two Brooklands Avenue. The proposal does create um, a blank elevation um, here, losing some of the activity from this frontage compared to the um, full application. This is not ideal, however, given the trees um, which would partially screen um, this frontage um, and the justification for retaining the gable in terms of the access issues, um, officers considered that the um, retained gable and associated alterations have been successfully integrated um, into the scheme and consider that it would not harm the, the character of the area and would lead to an improvement on the form of view of the site. From Clarendon Road, um, the variation in form is, is retained. Um, and the proposal would not be dominant in views from this aspect. Um, the PV panels are um, located in uh, discrete locations um, and given that the um, where they are, they don't interrupt the contemporary lines of the development and given the scale would not be overly visible from from street level. So this is the comparison. So this was the full um, application view from Clarendon Road, um, and this is the um, section 73. So from further along Clarendon Road, um, the proposal remains um, the same, except um, from the enlarged uh, ven ventilation screen here. Um, and then obviously um, the PV panels, which are on the um, southern elevations here and along here. Um, this is very minor and, and the impact here remains the same um, and is considered acceptable. Taking all these views into account um, and as detailed in the committee report, the, the conservation officer supports the proposed changes, stating that the um, the works um, within the new within the new constraints of the site, um, they work within that and still provide a modern counterpoint to the highly decorative terrace. Noting this, um, officers conclude that the proposal will preserve and enhance the character and appearance of the conservation area, and would not harm the setting of the Grade Two listed buildings, the Albert Home, Al Royal Albert Homes, um, adjacent to the site on the opposite side of Brooklands Avenue. So um, residential amenity, the impact on residential amenity is considered acceptable um, and the changes which would give rise to the uh, amenity issues are limited to changes um, in scale of building A um, as detailed on the screen now uh, and the PV panels as identified in the committee report. There are a few residential um, occupiers um, within the within close proximity of the the site um number six is in residential use and uh, given the separation distance and varied form and height of the proposal officers consider that the impact on amenity re remains not significant to this neighbor while the adjacent neighbor uh, number three is in office use after discussions with the neighbor there um, has been a reduction in the number of voids um, in the western elevation to alleviate the concerns of overlooking um, from these voids here. 
Um, these are above head height, um, so no views would be um, able to be seen of the uh, neighbour's garden. Uh, this is demonstrated by these um, visuals here. You'll see that it's um, above two metres in height, these um, voids, um, and obviously there's been one removed here. Uh, some concerns have been raised regarding the glint and glare impact to surrounding residents, um, yet it um, surprisingly is not ge geometrically possible for the solar panels to impact the closest residential neighbours, so along Clarendon Road here, and uh, number six, Brooklands Avenue, which is here, given the sighting of the um, solar panels and the height of the um, proposed buildings where the PVs would be placed um, alongside the proximity um, from these neighbours. Basically, it's too close for it to be um, visible um, from the roof. Um, the identified receptors in the glint and glare assessment um, are further down um, Brooklands Avenue. Um, these are residential properties here, so C9 to C12, um, and the glint and glare assessment um, states that views of the solar panels will be screened by um, protected trees along um, Clarendon Road, but also built form. Um, so the impact arising from um, the installation of PV panels would not be significant um, to residential amenity. Um, officers um, agree with this assessment um, and consider that no, no impact would arise here. So um, the sustainability of the, the scheme uh, on the original consent, um, an, informative or an informative was requested by members at the planning committee to achieve maximum levels of carbon reduction. In response to this, given the fact that they had to um, retain the gable due to access issues, um, the applicant has taken the opportunity to amend the energy strategy to push the operational um, carbon emissions towards net zero. Um, the development further minimises the energy demand through fabric performance and energy efficiency measures, such as the optimisation of mechanical, electrical and public health systems, alongside the installation of PV panels for renewable energy generation. As a result, the development poses a significant improvement um, in operation and operational building um, carbon emissions. Rates of um, 95%, 95 95.3% 95 for building A and 108% um, for building B in excess of the building regulations and achieves eight out of nine credits for energy as part of the BRIAM assessment, whereas the original scheme was only achieving four credits. Um, this exceeds the standards um, of the development um, and it results in development being an example for sustainable design and construction in Cambridge. Um, this was really welcomed by the planning team and the sustainability officer and um, is considered commendable. So taking um, all of the factors into account, um, officers consider that the proposal creates a high quality development that respects the character of the area and sen sensitively responds to the heritage assets within close proximity of the site and pushes the boundaries of sustainable design and construction. Um, accordingly, officers' recommendation is one of approval subject to conditions and the heads of terms um, set out on screen um, now. Officers um, ask members for delegated authority to enter into a Section 106 agreement to um, to uh, get those um, contributions to the TRISM trial um, as uh, requested by the um, County Highways team. So I've, I've got headline conditions on here um, on the screen now, and these include um, BRIAM excellence minimum, um, submission of, of details, um, hands off landscaping, 
um, several design details such as window details and dormer details um, and obviously biodiversity um, enhancements and uh, surface and foul water drainage details. So thank you, Chair. Thank you, Alice. So the recommendation is one of approval. Um, <clears throat> just before we go to the speaker, a uh, couple of things. So firstly, Alice, you used the acronym EIA, so that's an environmental impact assessment. And by the way, I forgot to say what a DPA is when I gave my chat at the start, so that's Data Protection Act with regard to anything written in the chat. And I'm just going to ask Toby to make it clear to everyone what Section 73 application is. Please, Toby. Thanks, Chair. Hopefully this is familiar to members, but a Section 73 application is an application and vary or remove a condition or conditions. So in this case, um, the application is seeking to vary the approved plans that are secured through a condition on the commission. So the main issues before members are um, really the comparison between what's been um, approved and what's being proposed and the planning consequences of that. Thank you. Thank you, Toby. I hope you don't mind me asking Toby Alice, but he was right next to me. You're a long way away, so thanks. Um, so the speaker, the uh, architect, is it? Yeah, do you want to come to the speaker's table then, please? Um, Oliver, uh, yeah. Um, so you press the button on the right-hand side. You've got three minutes to speak. Half a minute before the end, the bell will go to let you know you're coming to the end. Right, when you're ready. My name is Oliver Unwin of Allies Morrison Architects. We are the architects for the proposal and I'm, I am speaking on behalf of the applicant, Prudential Real Estate and Renbridge. Two main factors have led to the design changes for which the application is made. Number one, retention of the gable wall of one to two Brooklands Avenue. Number two, net zero carbon aspirations. Despite our client's best efforts, the owners of City House are not prepared to allow the contractor any form of access to their land to complete the demolition of 1 to 2 Brooklands Avenue. The gable end wall therefore needs to be retained and as a result we've had to revisit the original consented scheme. The proposed revisions follow the same principles as the consented scheme with the key change at first floor and roof level where the scheme has been adjusted to account for the profile of the retained gable end wall. The resulting design and architectural composition has been carefully considered in consultation with the council officers to ensure a complementary design that retains the same high quality modern counterpoint to the remainder of the terrace. As part of this amendment, we have also incorporated changes within the design that aim for net zero carbon emissions by reducing carbon emissions and increasing the amount of on-site renewable energy generation. These changes now before you significantly enhance the environmental performance of the new buildings to deliver a 108% betterment on building regulation requirements compared to the consented scheme, which proposed a 23% betterment. This will result in a further saving of 126 tonnes of CO2 per annum. This level of improvement substantially surpasses the minimum requirements set out within the local plan and the Sustainable Design and Construction SPD. Design changes to the scheme provide a way forward within the new constraints of the site. We hope that members see this application as being a great example of sustainable development and a proposal that will respond positively to the character of the conservation area setting. We urge you to give your support. A member of the applicant team from Rembridge is present to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thanks, Oliver. <clears throat> um, so you're welcome to stay there or sit back, whatever, it's up to you. Okay, so uh, we'll go over to debate. Uh, I'll just say a couple of things first in debate. So firstly, I'd say to the applicant that um, obviously the matter of the Gable War is a civil matter. Would it have been better if the applicant had sorted that out first before having to come back here and use up council resource 
for another council meeting to debate this item. However, and I presume that's my presumption on that. If I'm wrong, then please, officers, correct me. Um, however, the you know I'm reassured by officers who say that it's not geometrically possible for the addi additional solar panels, which has come as part of this scheme on the table today, um, to be a problem. So that's good. And the applicant is to be congratulated on improving all of that. Well done. That's really good. So um, uh, I think that's all the only points I wanted to make. Um, oh, one other thing is a um, question for the officer. Um, so we're presented with this new iteration with Gable Wall in place. So, I mean, the question is, is it possible for the applicant to uh, remove the Gable Wall? And I presume that will be at a greater cost to the applicant. other councillors, so Councillor Thornborough. Thank you for the very comprehensive presentation. Um, my, I'd just like to know about, has there been, or do, I noticed there's a condition about noise, and I just wondered if you could, um, is there concern about the roof plant on building A? And I know you mentioned that there's some plant behind the screen at ground level. Um, are there concerns about noise from that as well? And will the condition be sufficient to mitigate or ensure that there, there can be mitigations if, the, if noise becomes a problem? And then I'd, I'd just like to say, I think it's it really, really good that the building in use is, ta is aiming for net zero carbon emissions. I think this is what we definitely want in Cambridge and it's great that something much more than we can ask for is coming forward. I, I just urge the designers to um, let us know if they've considered um, energy in construction and whether they've considered alternative uh, new forms of construction which would minimize the carbon footprint during construction because um, that's something we would like to um, encourage and also at the end of the building life we'd like people to think about deconstruction so if they are thinking about those it'd be lovely to hear but thank you very much. Thank you Councillor. Um, Councillor Gossett Wood. Um, I, I, well it's great pity that um, your neighbour, the neighbours, and you haven't been able to come to an agreement to remove this um, gable wall. I did wonder whether there was any saving in CO2 emissions from retaining this wall, um, and whether this wall uh, met current, you know, high insulation standards, and whether you were able to do anything about that. Um, certainly commend, um, I think it's commend the use of solar panels and being energy efficient. Um, it makes good commercial sense now, of course, to future-proof buildings, um, apart from um, moving to net zero, which we need to do. And of course, part of building regulations will only probably get tougher on this. So now the other thing is the big tree at the front left on the photographs of Brooklands Avenue, that does seem to help balance the change in the dormer and the windows where they're situated. Um, and I wonder whether that big tree is going to be retained. It's much larger than the trees that I think are going to be planted along the, um, along the gable wall and um, part of the new block. It is very disappointing that gable wall looks very blank. Um, you know, seen from Brooklands Avenue, and of course you can see it round from the other side from Clarendon. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Pora. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, really, my concerns, I struggle to understand why the adjoining landowner can refuse permission. I mean, my understanding with, you know, party wall agreements is, you know, it's served and you do the work. 
And I'm also concerned that, as far as I'm aware, the landowner adjoining didn't object during the entire planning process. And for me, you know, the, the, the sawtooth roof continuing was part of the reason I was supportive of taking down that particular building. Now, I understand from the planning officer, because I did email her in advance to say I was likely to flag this up, that there has been work done on this. But I, it just seems really frustrating that, you know, every residential property, we all have neighbours who make improvements, call hassle, noise, stress, and I'm struggling to understand, and maybe I need to ask Keith this, how it can be absolutely refused. Because in effect, what that's doing is making this design less desirable. I think I accept the conservation area says, officer says it's still okay. I'm not suggesting I'm necessarily gonna vote against this. I just, I'm struggling to see how we could have ended up in a situation where the applicant, from what I gather, has made efforts to do this, has offered money and other things. The second question I suppose is if I look on page 30 of the permitted views, which is the comparison between the old and the new, looking at that gable end, if I understand correctly then, the applicant doesn't own the land that those little trees are put on. So could I confirm whether those, because obviously for me, those smaller trees which are running along the car parking of the adjoining property, or adjoining offices, sorry, would obviously reduce some of the impact of that blank wall. But I'm a little concerned now that if that isn't their land, are the trees already there? Are they part of our landscaping conditions? So I wonder if someone could remind me. Because if they're not there, if we can't control it and have them put in, then that is it's going to be a very blank end, which is a, which is a real shame because I, I don't understand. In terms of neighbourliness, I would expect all of our businesses to work together to try and you know, facilitate each, each other's development, particularly something like this, which is making it much more towards net zero. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Good point, first point, second point. I think I understand the page. That's it. The page piercing in the, in the pictures. Yeah, OK. Right, I've got it. Thank you. Uh, any more? No? OK. Back to Alice then for answers then, please, Alice. Oh, sorry, Councillor Goldthorpe Wood. Um, I did, I forgot to add this. Yeah, is, are there any issues um, about demolition and build within the site and deliveries, um, given the neighbours seem to be being rather awkward? Thank you. Right, Alice, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, so in terms of... Um, noise um, from the roof plant condition 13 um, requires the applicant to submit uh, a noise assessment um, prior to the installation of plants um, to um, ensure that excessive noise will not result from the plant um, proposed. Um, environmental health um, suggested this condition. This condition was um, part of the original full application um, and it hasn't been discharged yet because um, obviously they're not at a point to provide those details um, necessarily at this point um, and it has obviously in the condition it's um, provided to the council and approved by us prior to the installation of the plant so that should provide some comfort for members um, in terms of the big tree um, directly outside of um, this well directly to the front of one to two Brooklands Avenue that falls within the site boundary um, and is being retained as part of the development um, I believe um, it falls within the uh, conservation area and so um, it is protected. Um, in terms of the trees um, adjacent to building A, so to the east um, within the ownership, um, these are within the land um, of City and Unix House um, outside the application site boundary. Um, don't believe that these fall within the conservation area um, so are not protected um, so 
and obviously they fall outside the application site so do not um, form part of the landscaping um, of the site itself um, which we have control of um, in terms of um, kind of views um, from uh, Brooklands Avenue further to the east of that gable um, end obviously they as I've said in in the presentation and in the report they are partially um, it is partially screened by those trees um, but also I'd like to remind members that um, this uh, gable wall is as existing and um, I do appreciate that the full application did um, remove this and create um, additional gables along that elevation. Um, but this is an existing gable and it's an existing feature within the street scene. Um, in terms of uh, why the gable needs to be retained, um, in terms of this, um, you have to have an access license to carry out works on um, adjacent land for construction um, and the owners have not granted um, this access license and so um, the, basically the safe demolition of that gable is not possible um, given the height of it and its location um, on the boundary and the, and the width of the site um, and, and other um, construction kind of reasons. I'm not, um, you know, a construction expert in that respect, but I've been informed by the applicants and there has been discussions within the team about kind of ways to retain um, the original um, full scheme um, and remove that gable, but um, it's not it's not been possible to do so um and then the last um point related to that was whether the gable could be um demolished within the site um given its low location and height um as well as the the width of of the site i believe um the contractors um, said that the safe demolition was was not possible. Um, I believe that that is um, an answer to to what members the, the questions that members have, have risen. But if I've um, left anything out or forgotten anything, please do please do voice those um, questions again. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thanks, Alice. That's great. I think we have got a couple of questions to come back on. I'll start. So just on that cable wall. I you know, you did answer the question. I suppose just to push that a bit further, just so I'm clear and we're all clear. Um, you know, it, if I could use as a comparison viability studies. So if an applicant comes forward with a viability study of, you know, the financial viability of to, to compare with their viability study, you know, you said that the applicant has given you information about the ability to bring down that cable wall safely. That's from the applicant. Would it be the case that we might want to have our own study that we would get ourselves? It would be our study to compare with what they're saying is possible so that we we can see for ourselves what is possible in terms of what we've we've um, we've got as a, as a planning authority, or is that just unreasonable and you you go with what the applicant is saying? That's my question. Uh, Councillor Gawcrop Wood has a question, I think. Yeah, it was the question I asked before about if you retain, uh, as in these current plans, retaining of that gable wall, does this mean there's a saving in CO2 emissions from demolition? Can that be quantified? Um, another question, I forgot what it was, but um, yeah. Thank you, Thank you. Any more? Councillor Can I just make a, a just cut following on from your what you were saying? My understanding that this, the demolition work has already been carried out, and the the contractors and applicants have gone to great uh, measures to retain that wall um, because of the 
um, they because of the, this lack of agreement and um, the it's a big financial load to retain it and the way they've had to do it to comply with health and safety and on building sites health and safety is absolutely paramount so my understanding is that you you do have a right to use the neighboring property for maintenance but not for what was necessary to remove this wall. Yeah. I've remember what the second point was, which was this gable wall, is it going to need quite a lot of work to bring it up to modern building standards, insulation and whatnot? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Cora. Councillor Thorne was partially addressed what I was asking, so I'm just struggling to understand how someone can say no to access, because my understanding was certainly for residential properties, you have to allow your neighbour to do party wall works. And I'm, I suppose I'm, I would just really like to note my disappointment that the adjoining property owners didn't raise this. As, as the chair mentioned, this has meant that we've had to bring it back to committee because a neighbour didn't tell at the time that they weren't willing to allow it. It was obvious at the time. And it's just disappointing that that neighbouring adjoining company are going to then let a less beautiful bit of architecture stand when it could have been replaced by something better. I suppose the final question is, I'm assuming that we couldn't make it look a bit more sawtoothed. I'm guessing that's a no, but I'd just like to do that. I mean, for me, I'm really not keen on the, out, the look of that house and the sawtooth roof offset it for me, but I understand that that isn't what we're looking at today. But that's why I'm just interested why it does have to be completely flat in that same way. Is there no way we could change it slightly? Thank you, Councillor. All good points, but your middle point, Alice, I don't think you need to respond to. That's a question, more of a rhetorical question aimed at the applicant. The applicant can do what they want on their land and choose to say or not say what they wish to say, I presume. But if Keith wants to say anything, legal officer, that's that would be good as well. So back to you then, Alice, please. Thank you, Chair. So in terms of um, kind of the uh, viability or the checking of um, construction techniques that they have um, kind of explored, um, we don't typically um, check these via kind of third party construction advice. That is not something that I've ever come across before. Um, in terms of kind of health and safety, um, that's partially some of the reasons why um, the demolition within the site of that gable wall um, is not is not possible, um, as alluded to by by Councillor Thornborough. Um, and um, just going back to kind of the access issues, um, so access to an adjacent site for maintenance is different um, in compared to construction. Um, you have to get a construction license, which is almost like a gift from the adjacent landowner um, to construct um, development um, along a, a, a boundary or on the adjacent site. And that's just not been granted by the adjacent landowner after kind of extensive kind of discussions and and kind of um, you know propositions. Um, in terms of the um, savings made um, from the retention of the gable, um, and I'm I'm not sure of those figures. Um, so I. I Apologies, I can't. I can't provide information in that respect. Um, I'm not sure just whether talk, the Alice. Just hold on a minute. Um, Trevor Hollinger. Hello, Trevor. You've come onto screen, and um, it's a bit, oh, hello. Yeah, you're going now, are you? Oh, uh, are you up for a second, a next item, or something? Are you to speak? No, no. Sorry, I'm just. I, I'm. I'm monitoring. I'm going to to turn up uh, for an item at the end. I'll I'll turn my mic and camera off. My apologies. Oh, OK, if you, because it's just a bit distracting for this item, if you want to turn your yeah. camera off, please, Trevor. Thank you. OK, sorry about that, Alice. You carry on. Apologies. That's OK. Um, in So I, I don't have the figures um, in respect of whether the cable wall would save um, carbon emissions due to retaining that part of the structure. I don't know if the um, the architect or, or the construction company 
um, representative can can expand on that. Um, in terms of the retaining the gable wall and whether that um, can be brought up to modern standards, obviously, <clears throat> as outlined in the report and in the presentation, um, the you know sustainability in terms of carbon emissions and construction um, practices is way beyond um, what we require in policy standards. So the retention of the gable end has not prevented um, meeting or exceeding those standards and and rather has kind of posed a um, kind of almost a new constraint and a new challenge for the for the architects to overcome um, in terms of sustainable design. Um, in terms of um, whether the um, gable end could be adapted to um, kind of alter the appearance. And um, this is something that um, officers and the uh, architects and an agent has has explored um, in terms of kind of, um, you know, uh, punching, punching holes within the gable end to have um, windows or altering the um, the massing at um, the top so it's not as um, you know flat um, but to do this safely it's just not feasible um, it was concluded so I, I appreciate the comments regarding um, the kind of the the um, architectural merits of the full um, application design in terms of the the gable elements um, but unfortunately, um, for those access reasons, um, it, it's not possible to to do um, that in this in this instance. So I think I've uh, addressed those issues, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Alice. So I think we've debated it very fully. A bit more, uh, Councillor Thornborough. Sorry, this is uh, about the trees on the adjacent property. It's been highlighted that the there's a row of existing trees um, on just onto the, the east elevation that um, affect that get the gable that's retained. And I know that the um, there is condition 22 is hard and soft landscaping, which includes historic landscape features. When when the that condition is met, will that include the construction of the new building to ensure that those existing trees um, are protected and allowed to grow to their full height and width because they are existing trees and they are, seem to be an important feature that we've identified. Thank you, Councillor. Let's make this the last round of any questions. And is there any more from anyone? I think there's debate on there. I think, yeah. Okay. So that one question, then, please, Alex. So in terms of the protection of those trees, um, there has been um, tree protection measures um, which were secured under the full application. Those conditions, um, I can give you the specific condition numbers. So they are um, condition 31, um, which requires um, an arboricultural method statement and tree protection plan. Um, 32, a tree site meeting. Um, tree uh, condition 34, and um, which relates to the implementation of those measures. And 34, uh, th 35, sorry, um, relates to replacement of trees within five years if um, they are harmed. So um, those conditions are still on the section 73 um, consent. So um, trees um, within the site and surrounding the site will be protected um, given those conditions. Um, in terms of the hard and soft landscaping condition, um, condition 22, that relates to the hard and soft landscaping proposed and existing in, proposed and retained even um, within the site not necessarily the um, trees outside the site, from my understanding. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Alice. I felt
comes up from the councillor. So in that case, we'll go to the recommendation. And Toby, do you want to read the recommendation out, please? Thanks, Chair. The recommendation is set out on page 32 of the report. Clarify officers do not consider this proposal to be environmental impact um, assessment development. The recommendation is to approve subject to the conditions and subject to the completion of a section 106 agreement, the terms of which are set out within the report. <clears throat> Thanks, Toby. So all those in favour of that recommendation? Thanks, all councillors in favour, Chair. So the item is approved. Thank you very much. And thanks to the speaker and to officers. We'll take a short break now and come back at 11.15 for the next two items. Apologies, Neil, I know you're waiting to speak on the next item, which was uh, an item carried over from the last meeting. But I think it's best that we just have a short break to you know, come to a break. Thank you very much.
we'll move on to the next uh, item now, the first minor application of the day, item six, um, rear of one Priory Street. We've got one speaker on this item, I believe, item six, who is Neil Walker. I think you're, you're going to be there on screen, Neil, but you don't need to speak yet. So firstly, we'll have the case officer to present the item. Um, so we're, oh, that's Charlotte, Charlotte Spencer. Hello, Charlotte. Morning. Um, morning, Chair. Morning. I think we're all good to go, aren't we? We've got everyone here. Yep. So if you want to present the item then, please, Charlotte. Thanks. Uh, so, could you just confirm uh, you can see my screen and point out and can hear me clearly? Yes, and yes, thank you. Okay, so uh, the application is for an erection of a new single story dwelling to the rear of number one Priory Street. It's been brought to committee as a third party representations, which are contrary to officer recommendation. The application refers to uh, part of the residential garden for number one Priory Street. Uh, the area is residential in character and appearance and the site lies within the Castle and Victoria Road conservation area and it lies within a controlled parking zone. Um, so the proposed dwelling would replace an existing outbuilding as shown here and a small garden area with a cycle and bin store just shown here. Um, and these are just demonstrating the plans. So um, the dwelling would be a single storey dwelling uh, for one person. So just to explain the site history. Um, so previously this year, an application was refused under delegated powers. Um, these are the plans here, it's for a one and a half storey dwelling in this same plot. Uh, it was considered that um, due to the impact on the street scene, the impact on the residential amenity of number three Priory Street, as well as number seven and 7A Westfield Lane, as well as um, concerns about the amenity space and safety issues with the unadopted track at the rear. The application before members is a resubmission of the refused and the proposed dwelling has been reduced in size the main entrance location has been changed to come out onto Westfield Lane and further details regarding the overlooking of the garden area have been provided. Uh, so to quickly go through the material considerations. So in terms of the visual impact and impact on the conservation area, the development would read part of Westfield Lane, which has been developed over time as backland development from properties on Huntington Road. Um, there are examples of modern buildings in the area. This one is on the corner of Westfield Lane and Benson Street. And this one is um, on the corner of Westfield Lane and Priory Street here. Um, it is acknowledged there will be some loss of the visual open gap. However, single storey buildings are common within the area um, along Priory Street. Um, the loss of trees and greenery is, is unfortunate. As you can see, it's quite green at the moment. Um, however, the limited um, height would allow for longer views of the greenery to remain visible. Um, in addition, it's noted that Westfield Lane is quite a narrow street, but based on the height of the existing boundary treatment, it's considered that the additional sense of enclosure would be limited and not great enough to warrant a refusal. In addition, there are no objections from the conservation officer subject to conditions regarding materials. In terms of residential amenity and neighbours, um, it's been considered that due to the separation distance between the, the site and the host dwelling at number one, there'll be limited impact on the host dwelling. Uh, due to the depth of the proposed dwelling and the siting along the boundary line, there would be some impact on number three. However, due to the separation distance from the main property, as well as that it has an existing garage in the rear 
officers consider that the level of harm would not be great enough to warrant a refusal. As the proposal is now single storey, it's considered there'll be limited impact on numbers 7 and 7A Westfield Lane, which is here. In terms of the um, residential immunity for future occupiers, the internal space complies with the national space standards. It is noted that the garden is small, but the dwelling is for one person and officers consider it will be large enough to sit outside and dry clothes. And just to clarify, the site is within walking distance of a park. Um, in terms of overlooking to the garden area, the applicants have submitted um, further details in terms of sight lines from the host dwelling, as you can see here, um, because of the uh, cycle store, um, wouldn't actually see the small courtyard area. And from numbers 7 and 7A, Westfield Lane, due to the boundary treatment, this would be the sight line here, so it would actually be quite limited. And then just to clarify the last few points, um, it would be car free and it, this is considered acceptable due to the closeness, the how close it is to the city centre and the transport routes along Huntingdon Road. Uh, covered and secure cycle parking and easily accessible cycle stores being provided and the Highways Authority have raised no objections. There's no formal objection to the loss of the trees subject to conditions protecting the trees that should be retained and then replacement trees. The biodiversity net gain is considered to be dealt with by condition and any drainage concerns is covered by the building regulations. Uh, so to conclude, officers consider that the proposal overcomes the previous reasons for refusal and therefore recommends approval subject to the conditions listed. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Charlotte. Uh, so um, before we go to debate, we have the speaker, Neil Walker, if you want to come on to screen, Neil, or just speak. Oh, hello, Neil. Good morning. So good morning. Um, hi. You've got three minutes to speak. Um, <clears throat> just half a minute before the end, the bell all goes to so let you know you come in to the end of your time. So when you're ready then, Neil, thanks. Right. Thank you very much. And thank you for that presentation by the case officer. So I'm Neil Walker um, of 3 Priory Street, where I've lived for almost 30 years. And obviously the planning committee will discuss the design amenities or lack thereof. I'd like to comment just on three things which are perhaps more general. There's been an attempt, particularly by the developer, to characterise the Bensing area as being subject to infill. This has not been the case. There have been 15 houses built on Westfield Lane, all of which are on the back of Huntington Road, not on the roads on the inside. There have been 18 new houses built on North Street, and they're all on the garden ends of Histon Road, while the houses that have been built on Canterbury Street all use land from two properties, as far as I can tell. And the reason why is our gardens are much shorter. So the garden from Huntington Road is 50 metres long. I measured it. The gardens from Histon Road are more like 46 metres. Again, I measured it, whereas the ones in Priory Street are more like 40 metres. This matters because when a developer says they're going to divide the plot and not the garden, it means the end of the plot becomes much closer to the host housing, as you've described it. Um, so I've reckoned that this proposal will put a brick wall down three quarters of my garden, ending at seven metres from our back door. It's quite interesting that the back door is not where it's shown on the maps that you've been seen, because the developer chose to use a map that's out of date, and the extensions to numbers three and five that were, went through planning permission in 2007 and 2004 are not shown. So our, our houses extend slightly further, and this will put a brick wall with a cycle store seven metres from our back door and a brick wall where fences and greenery all the way down. Second matter is there's been attempted again by the developer, not by the case officer, to describe this as a brownfield site. This is not. This is a well-loved and well-tended garden and a much-loved local amenity. The back lane is graveled. It has blackberries. It is widely used for people to walk through on the way to the park that was mentioned. So I did put a quote in my public comment from the previous um, uh, delegated survey, which I will read if there is time, but it, they were saying it's a shame to lose all this greenery in an overbuilt area, effectively. The third thing I'd like to comment on is, is a suggestion this is neutral to people who aren't immediately close to it. Um, 
So Westfield Lane is narrow and work would be intrusive, particularly the building, the work and wherever the lorries go and all that. But the other residents on Priory Street who Charlotte spoke to and they're elderly and therefore couldn't manage the application process to put a formal complaint in or whatever, were very worried that their access to their gardens and their garages would be restricted by placing a building on what is a corner of a very narrow road. And if de facto you end up trying to close that piggy lane, which is the little gravel bit, that will become really problematic. You know, the residents do not want this precedent set of putting infill into the houses inside, away from the big houses. Um, and again, I'd ask the case officer maybe to reflect on what was said to her when the original thing was uh, refused. Thank you. That's what I wanted to say. That's great. Thanks very much, Neil. OK, so um, if you want to turn your camera off, Neil, uh, you're welcome to you know, stay and listen to debate if you wish. Um, councillors, debate. Uh, Councillor Dryden. Um, when the last uh, application was refused, was it only the height of the the building then, the reason for refusal. Thank you, Councillor. Um, in what that circumstance that would? Um, my co this is a comment that the whole thing looks a little bit tight on the space available. Um, and given that we're looking to things being landscaped and led, I did worry about the lock loss of garden and the amount of hard standing I also wondered whether there was space for the builders and deliveries, as well as um, would it affect the access to the garages behind the comment um, of one of the things raised by the objector. Um, I'm also concerned, would it be rather hot? I, can't, I can only see roof windows in the plans. Space for the bikes. Um, relieved that this would be a parking-free site um, and I wondered about PV and green roofs, if you could comment on that. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Thornborough. Um, I'm concerned that this is described as a dwelling, but it's been designed as, as a, a unit for one person. It's only one metre above the minimum space standards. And my concern it's not in the description, it's not described as a one person dwelling. And I don't know whether the, it can be controlled as one person. And it's fine for one person, but if, if they're a couple, what's to stop a couple that living in there and then end up having a child and then, you know, that, and then actually being really substandard as far as provision of space is concerned. But so there's, that's one concern. My other concern is the bedroom has a window on the side, which is the lane. And I'm concerned that that little window, I don't know if it's openable, but um, you do normally need openable windows. And I, how will that be effect? Is that, will that be safe? It's on the ground floor, people are going backwards and forwards there. How are we going to get secure ventilation and for people to feel safe? Um, in that sort of situation. And I know the roof lights are above, but it, it still is this sort of same questions about that, I think. Councillor, Councillor Thora. Thank you, Chair. I wonder if the officer could comment on what the objector said. So I think they said they were concerned that the brick wall would be seven metres from their buildings, but it says 14 in the report, so which would be correct. I am concerned about the loss of biodiversity, so again, be grateful for the officer's guidance as to whether that is a material issue. I fear it may not be. Um, and could the officer also talk just a little bit about the unadopted track, which is obviously running, well, either in front or behind, how you look at it, and what those other uh, buildings are used for. Are, are they properties or are they garages and outhouses? Because yeah, it, to me, it, it's verging on too big for too small a site and I'm interested actually that they've left what I think is gravel at the front um, and normally obviously we do like to see a bit of frontage but actually in some ways moving it further along might have given a little bit more garden space because it's leaving number one with not a huge amount so again it, I'm just yeah it, 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 
it's just being too large on the plot for me at the moment. I'm a little bit concerned about that. And combined with the fact he's a very verdant and green thing at the moment. So if the officer could talk about what trees are being protected, that I think she mentioned, which are coming out, that would be really useful. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Thornborough again. Sorry, I forgot another question. Um, the host house, well, this, the red line is only around part of the, the garden of the host house, so it seems like the applicant doesn't actually have control of the host house because it's not outlined in blue. But the, um, the reduction in amenity of the host house, I think in a lot of these applications is not explained. So the impact on the host house, I would like more information about where they store bins currently. How, what about bicycle for, for the host house? So cycle parking and bin parking is important and I'd like to know the impact on the host house. Um, and whether the amenity on the host house, the amenity space, um, is at a, a mix, remains at an acceptable level. It's not just the area of the garden that's, that's provided. Thank you. Councillor, uh, okay, so I'll just say a couple of things before I go back to you for answers. Um, so the speaker, Neil, spoke about it in Phil. I don't know if you wanted to comment on that. He said about it not being, most of the developments locally weren't in a villa at all. Uh, he also spoke about the lengths of the gardens being 50, 46 and 40 metres long and how that might influence the way that the development would um, uh, relate to his property next door. And also he spoke about the map that was used being out of date. So those, there were those things. And one thing for me is in terms of space standards, which been, have been mentioned already, so the development is uh, proposed to be 40 square meters. The requirement for a one person development is 39 square meters. So it's, it's policy compliant in that respect. We've never really bottomed out in this committee where what happens when you get these applications come forward for one person when it could be two persons because the space standards say for two persons, it's completely different. It's 50 square meters. So in a sense, unless we're told differently about officers, it appears that for one or two persons, it can be 39 square metres, because who's to say whether it's a single bed or a double bed? I mean, it uh, looks like a single bed has been drawn, but the drawing is so small it's difficult to tell. But um, it seems very small. It's, it's almost the minimum size for a dwelling, which I think is 37 square metres from memory, um, and a tight space with little amenity. So that's a fact. If you could say anything about that, that would be useful. Um, go back to the officer now then, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I'll bring the presentation back up. It might be easier. Um, in terms of um, the reason for refusal on the previous application um yes it did specifically refer to the height being a lot of the issues especially in terms of appearing dominant within the street scene and kind of blocking the visually open gap um to go to the sorry I'm back so at the moment in terms of pv panels so there's two um PV panels being shown here and also the design and access statement does refer to potentially looking at air source heat pumps although it's noted this is not shown on any plans. Um, in terms of green roofs none of the roofs are actually flat so we can't enforce that. Um, the just the window um, being openable um, at the rear for the bedroom. Um, I'm sure Toby will correct me if I'm wrong, but that will obviously end up coming within building regulations and making sure that it's it meets the requirements that they need in terms of being able to leave and escape. There are windows also at the top here, um, and I believe there aren't every single kind of ridge kind of bits. Um, to uh, allow additional light. Uh, 
trying to get through my notes when you're talking there. Um, yeah, so it is only one metre above the minimum for, for one person dwelling. And it is, as um, Chair kind of mentioned, we don't really have a way of stopping two people moving into it. It would not be something that would be enforceable. In much more to say on that. Um, I did mention the difference in the report about, um, as the objector mentioned, about the plans being slightly incorrect. Let me just check. I believe one of the councillors said I put 14 metres. So bear with me as I kind of just scroll through. So, yeah, in my report, I mentioned that the main dwelling would be 13 metres from the rear of number three and the cycle store would be located seven metres away. Um, and that was based on kind of up to date plans rather than using the plans that were submitted. Uh, so the unadopted track at the rear, um, also kind of known as Piggy, Piggy Lane, I believe. So this kind of access is. These um, are mostly garages and outbuildings down here. There's no existing dwellings and cars do use um, the unadopted track to for the occupiers of Priory Street to park their vehicles off the public highway, um, which was kind of one of the reasons there were concerns in the previous application because the entrance was leading directly onto um, Piggy Lane. But as you can see, there's an existing outbuilding here, which already kind of blocks views for vehicles and pedestrians coming out. And, and highways kind of no, raised no more further objections with that. I think actually the new building is set slightly further back. And I think if they were to move the building closer to this side here and um, to give a bit more garden space, there would start to be a conflict in terms of safety of the users of Piggy Lane. Um, I guess so you the, a there, Charlotte. Sorry to interrupt you. That's there. OK. You said there were only dwellings at the end there, but there are, of course, blocks of flats, aren't there, on the other side? Here, yes, there's block, blocks yeah, of flats. Yeah. Um, I was referring to up um, along the rear gardens of Priory Street. So it's just got some a couple at Canterbury Street at the end, which aren't kind of facing on. It's kind of the side. There's some flats here, and there's also some flats here. Yeah. Um, so as it was rightly pointed out, the host dwelling number one is not within the red outline, so it's difficult for us to control anything that's occurring here. Uh, I don't think I've got necessarily the measurements i'm just again checking through my report but um it was considered that for the size of number one that a sufficient amount of garden space would be retained um, terms of yeah it's the infill yes um so obviously huntington road gardens um you can see especially the ones which haven't been developed at the rear they are longer than the ones of priory street and um ex with exception to these flats the majority of the buildings are along westfield lane that have been developed within the garden land but we've got to kind of look at it in on case by case basis so the developments along huntington road have set a precedent for this backland development which is changing which has changed the grain of the area and um, so officers consider that a development here would not kind of impact that grain in any way um, in terms of the trees it's probably clearer and um, so some of the trees would be lost and I believe the condition would be to ensure the protected trees in the neighbouring gardens are not 
impacted? And I think that may have been answers to all the questions, but there was quite a few. So please let me know if I've missed any. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for Dryden. Just to clarify again on the reasons of refusal before, what we went to one, was that the only one or have any of the other reasons been, have they all been overcome? Um, Thank you, Councillor. I guess what you said, well, actually answer that first, because uh, just check what Councillor Dryden is asking there, please, Charlotte. Yeah, just uh, double checking the exact wording of all the refusal reasons. Um, so the first one was kind of the impact on the street scene and the loss of the visually open gap, which officers believe the fact that it's been reduced to single storey overcomes that concern. Um, again, so um, the again the height in terms of the residential community of number three and also number seven, seven and seven eight Westfield Lane. Again, by reducing the size and specifically the height, we believe that has been overcome. Um, they have demonstrated that um, the proposed amenity space would not be significantly overlooked, um, as shown. Let me just show it here. So again, you can see the sight lines coming from the first floor windows of the nearest dwellings. And again, the final reason was there was concern with the main entrance opening out onto Piggy Lane um, in terms of safety issues and the main entrance has been relocated. So it opens, sorry, opens up onto Westfield Lane. So Charlotte, is that okay, Councillor? Is that all you wanted from that, Councillor Dryden? I don't want to prolong this too much, but when they say they've altered the, the community space, have they made it bigger then than it was before? Did you get that, Charlotte? No, I believe it's so. No, I believe it's the same size. And um, they've just demonstrated um, a lot of our concerns was regarding that due to the proximity of neighbouring properties that it just wouldn't be private, and they've managed to kind of demonstrate to us that the direct overlooking would actually be limited due to the boundary treatment and then also the cycle store. OK, thank you. Um, right, Katie, Councillor Thornborough. Um, I'm still concerned about the the bit of land within the red line boundary next to the bedroom. Um, at the moment, from what from the aerial photographs, it looks like that that's part of the turning circle for vehicles to go up, up and down the lane. And I think the um, the window needs to be protected. And if the red line, there's this, there's some land owned by uh, this. Yeah, there's a within the red line boundary. There's a bit of land adjacent to the bedroom. I think we need a landscape condition to so that you have information about how that bit of um, external space is going to be detailed to protect the window because if it remains as it is now there's no, there would be nothing to stop vehicles going over that bit of land or even parking a car there you know you know and cars are dangerous they can they sometimes catch fire and that can be dangerous for the property so i would i don't think there's a landscaping condition but i i think i would like to see one Thank you, Councillor. Okay, so we're getting to quite a detailed conversation here, Councillors. So let's, let's, um, yeah, let's be careful we don't extend this debate longer than it needs to be. Um, and just on that question, I think the second question from Councillor there, Charlotte, as far as I can see, uh, the, on the proposed site plan, it looks like the red line boundary is the boundary that exists at the moment where the fence goes, so that there will be no change to access to the unadopted track. You to answer that, Charlotte. Uh, Councillor Bora. Thanks, Councillor Thorne. I just articulated my first point. I would certainly like to see a condition. Obviously, we can't have a high wall because of the visibility, but something to ensure that that 
bit of space on the end of the bedroom is, is sort of defensible and not driven over. My main concern is still the biodiversity net gain. I mean, we've got all the conditions there, but given what is there already and the fact that the amenity space is completely paved and I'm not good at the number of metres, but it's very small with three bins and at least one bike in there. I'm really struggling to see how this could ever achieve any biodiversity net gain, which for me is concerning because not only is this quite a large in comparison to the garden space development, but if we can't replace the biodiversity net gain, of course we can't put trees at the end, that will block the window and obscure the car visibility. So I wonder if the officer could talk more about that, please, because I think the biodiversity net gain conditions might not be achievable. And I don't really want us off-siting because that's not really appropriate for this size of development. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll stick to my comment earlier about the detail side of things, Councillor. So let's remember that the things that we pursue, we need to be able to back up with policy compliance in terms of, you know, whether we want to go against the officer recommendation. So Councillor Gorthrop Wood. Um, this is just to reiterate my earlier question. Um, I hope this can be backed up by policy, but it's about uh, doing the build, you know, access and afterwards, you know, lorries, deliveries, and, uh, and, and that also then affects how, I'm not sure how the unadopted road is currently used, but I'm also worried about access down Westfield Lane with the road. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that, Councillor. So I was going to comment on a couple of things. Biodiversity net gain and space standards, but Toby's going to speak about biodiversity net gain, so I'll leave it up to him. So just on space standards, that's, and as a example of things that I was referring to just now about detailed conversations, let's remember, councillors, that we need to st stick to policy in terms of the decisions we make. We've got a policy there that is um, difficult, you might say, as was outlined by the case officer, in that we have a policy which says that there's a different amount of space required for two people than for one person, but we have no way of enforcing it anyway. So effectively, the space standard for two people becomes the space standard for one person, it seems to me. Uh, uh, that's what's literally been said by the case officer, but Toby might comment on that as well. So in terms of that, let's just remember that the, the, th the arguments we're making, we need to be able to back up with policy. So Toby, biodiversity. Thanks, Chair. I think that um, biodiversity net gains is a difficult area, particularly if members are concerned and would want to possibly refuse permission on those grounds because our um, supplementary planning document talks about a combination of on and off and site net gain and um, usually within um, uh, garden land in particular has a low kind of metric value and as members will be aware there is greater value in combining um, biodiversity improvements um, off-site often. There is benefits in terms of the community to be doing that. So Condition 12 effectively um, reflects that approach um, in terms of how one deals with biodiversity, but also kind of allowing for um, off-site uh, vision to be made um, where appropriate. Um, as members will be aware, there are sites um, on the edge of Cambridge where significant biodiversity enhancements are likely to um, take place over the next 30 years and this might be one of those sites where a small contribution towards biodiversity would take place. Thanks, Toby. Okay, so um, back to you then, Charlotte, for answers to the other outstanding questions, please. Yeah, so at the moment, um, in uh, sorry, I've just been back. I forgot I was still sharing. So here, so I have been down um, the unadopted track at the rear, and although the site boundary is here, uh, there's nothing actually stopping anything so I I think it would be reasonable to add some a landscaping condition just to see how they're just gonna with a low wall 
block that off to ensure kind of protection of that window. Um, Toby just went over the BNG. Um, in terms of the the build, um, as you brought up again, so everything does need to occur within the red outline. That's what's kind of given permission. And just thinking about it because of the narrowness, narrowness sorry, of Westfield Lane, um, although highways didn't request it, it could potentially be reasonable to add a condition for a traffic management plan to ensure kind of that access can continue down Westfield Lane and the an adopted track throughout the build. Um, I think that was all of the questions. I think you asked again, sorry, um, Chair, about the internal space. But again, as, as you kind of mentioned, it, it wouldn't be enforceable if a second person chose to live there. We have to base it on policy and they're stating it's one bedroom. And we, we wouldn't be able to enforce or even know if a second person moved in there. Thank you. Okay, thanks for that. No more questions. So, um, recommendation, please, Toby. Thank you. Yeah, so, the recommendation is set out on page 56 of the report. The recommendation is to approve subject to the conditions as set out and subject to two additional conditions a landscape um, conditions which has specific reference to the landscaping facing the uh, unadopted track but would also cover the courtyard and a condition in terms of a construction traffic management plan. Thank you. So all those in favour of the recommendation. Five in favour, Chair. Those against? Eight against. Sorry, three against, Chair. <laughs> Again, no abstentions. OK, thank you much. So the uh, item is approved. Thanks very much. Thanks to the Speaker and Neil. And thank you to officers. So the next item we'll go to is 108 Suez Road. That's the second item yeah, that's been... Someone's gone over. Uh... Sorry, sorry. Uh, sorry, Chair. Um, I counted five in support and three against. That's eight, but there's only seven councillors. I think there's a bit of funny counting going on. Okay. Oh, okay. Let's, let's have a re revote. Let's vote again, shall we? So all those in favour of the recommendation... Or in favour, Chair. Right, and all those against? Yeah. So that's true, and no abstentions, as there are seven of us here in the room. So the item is approved, thank you very much. So uh, I meant to start, we'll go, uh, next item is 108 Suez Road, um, and that's the second of the two items that's been carried forward from the last planning meeting. So we'll do that one now, and then after that, I think it'd be good to have a break for lunch, as it's just coming up to 12 now. Yes, Councillor Corporate-Wood. Apologies, may I just nip, I'll take a coffee down myself. I just need to, I just need a short break. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, let's all have a short break then, so just a few minutes and come back as soon as you can after 12, thanks.
so welcome back after a short break. So the next item is item 7, 108 Suez Road. Alice Young is the officer. No public speakers, so Alice, when you're ready, present the item, please. You're on mute, Alice. There's a technical issue at the moment, Alice, and the producer is just sorting it out, so it should be done soon. Can you hear me now? Yeah, can do. Thank you. Are we all Brilliant. Okay, so when you're ready then, Alex, we can see the screen and we can hear you. Brilliant, thank you. So this application is for a single storey rear extension and a rear roof extension, including Juliet Balcony to 108 um, Suez Road and the erection of a new linked two bed dwelling and associated works. So the application has been brought to the planning committee as there's been two thirty third party objections um, to the application. Uh, the application site is located on the southwestern corner of Suez Road and Hobart Road and comprises a two storey end of terrace dwelling and rear garden land. The site falls outside of the control parking zone and the con conservation area and is in a residential area. The site does not contain any TPO trees. So this is the um, aerial visual um, of the site as well, just to give you some context. So the proposal seeks planning permission to erect a single storey rear extension roof and roof extension to 108. And then a new two bedroom, two storey, um, end of terrace dwelling and associated works. One car parking space would be provided for each dwelling, um, 108 to the front of 108. And the new dwellings rear car parking would be accessed off Hobart Road. Um, bins and bikes would be sited in designated structures in the rear gardens of the respective properties here and here. Uh, this is the um, eastern elevation, so this is the front elevation. Um, this is the new dwelling here. This is the north elevation. This is the western elevation. You'll see that it's um, matching in, in materials and style to the main house and the southern elevation. These are the proposed um, ground floor plans. First floor plans. And roof plan. And these are the proposed bike stores, which are flat roof. These are green roofs um, and it's the timber timber structure. So the main uh, material considerations are the impact on the character of the area and the impact on, on street car parking and the highway safety impact. So third party um, comments have raised concerns as to the impact on of the proposed development on the character of the area due to the scale and appearance of the dwelling. Given the siting on the end of the existing terrace, the proposed dwelling would conform to the spatial layout of the area continuing the existing terrace. The proposed two-storey scale, hipped roof design and bay window would result in the proposal being appropriately scaled and responding to the surrounding context. The openness of the western corner whilst 
reduced would be retained as the two storey form would be set off the northern boundary. Officers therefore consider that the proposal is um, a positive, um, provides a positive contribution to the surrounding area and is policy compliant. So these are um, site photographs of the area. And this um, dwelling here, uh, this extension and dwelling here is obviously similar to the proposal and that is just opposite the site. So the site is just here. Um, I also mentioned in the officer report that there is a mature tree and hedging um, which will be removed, but this has already been removed, as you can tell from the um, site photographs. And there are no trees on site. Um, the Google imagery um, does show a tree, but as I said, this has been removed. Um, whilst this is regrettable, um, the proposal includes new planting and will be required to meet biodiversity net gain. Um, concerns have also been raised um, regarding the impact on highway safety and on street car parking. The Highway Authority do not object to the application. Um, pedestrian visibility displays will be secured via condition to ensure the proposed accesses have adequate visibility to mitigate against conflict between ro road users. Therefore, officers um, have no highway safety concerns. Um, the proposal provides one car parking space per dwelling. Um, complying with council standards um, and it is located in a highly sustainable location with good services and transport links within close proximity along uh, Mill Road. Um, given this sustainable location and the car parking provision proposed, um, officers consider that a um, significant overspill effect um, of car parking on the surrounding streets would not arise. Therefore, taking policy and the views of consultees and wider stakeholders and other planning considerations into account, officers' recommendation is one of approval subject to um, conditions. Thank you, Chair. Right, thanks, Alice. Uh, so no speakers, so debate. So I'll start off. Um, it's on semantics. So you talked about linked dwelling. So sometimes that can mean a two dwellings that literally are linked together like an extension to one dwelling. But I think the implication here is that there are separate dwellings, but the linkage is to do with being an extension to the terrace. And you call it an end of terrace, but it's actually an extension to the terrace, isn't it? Because it makes it longer. Uh, TPO, that's tree preservation order. And on that, you said about the tree that isn't on Google Maps, or whatever it is, but also on what's it called the other thing, um, the thing I'm looking at anyway. I, I can see a tree online um, that's clearly in the way of the proposed building, uh, which, as you suggest, as you said, wasn't isn't there now. So I think we need some clarity on what's happened there, even if we don't do anything about it. So has the applicant removed? The, ooh, cut to the chase, has the applicant removed the tree so that they can then come forward with the project and have they done that um, contrary to, you know, any sort of regulation, whether it's TPO or whatever. That's my questions, points. So, Councillor Thornborough. Uh, I see there's a landscape condition, which is good because I'm concerned that the front door of the new dwelling, it, you have to go right past, you, you follow the path to the the existing front door of the host dwelling and then you have a little detour you just go i i know that there have i've come across um real neighbor problems where neighbors fall out and one and, and a neighbor can be feel very intimidated by the next neighbor and they're just if you, you can't avoid going right past the front door i just think the the landscaping of the approach to the front door is not adequate. And I think that could be picked up under the landscaping condition. Um, I'm also not happy with the um, bike and bin store in the rear garden of the host dwelling. It looks like, you might correct me, it looks like they need, they will go to get there. You, 
the assumption is it will go through the parking area of the new dwelling to get to the bike park of the host dwelling, if you see what I mean. That's, that's really, in, really not very good design because the, the, the car parking area might become filled with you know, basic paraphernalia of living and it may, be, it may obstruct the easy use of getting the bikes in and out and also the bins in and out. So I wondered if the officers could talk about that. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, who's next? Councillor Gothard Wood. Okay, yes, if you could sort out the boundaries between the new and the existing property on the plans. Like Martin, I'm concerned about landscape biodiversity in this tree that's disappeared. Parking, I know, has been a concern. I, I'm not so sure that this is so much of a concern now, but I did wonder whether or not the bike, the bike stores are going to be big enough for cargo bikes. Um, I also wondered about overlooking of the property in Hobart Road from from the new dormer and Juliet balcony. Um, and there appears to be, and I know you say that the dormer roof isn't suitable, it's not practical to have a green roof, but I'd like to see something on energy and PV, although I recognise this is a conversion, but also on the new property. Um, now, the other thing I just, I am aware that these were, are largely ex-council and family houses, and a lot of these have become uh, houses of multiple occupation in the area. So I do worry, that is where I worry about, although there is some parking, about whether or not extending the existing property will put pressure on the surrounding streets because this is quite a big it's going to be quite a big uh property um so you know we're talking six i think it's six people or six yeah six people i think at least um so i'd like your comments on that how that's going to be managed um i also wondered about the roof heights the ceiling heights on the top floors of both the existing and the new property it looks as though they slope so I wanted the actual usable space um, and on the ground floor of the existing property there's an internal utility room so I think somehow or other that has to be stopped from being turned into a habitable room thank you Councillor Councillor Bennett just a very brief point. Uh, page 71, 8.35, uh, um, Councillor Gorfoot Wood mentioned um, the cycle provision. And I'd just like to ask a supplementary question. Uh, she asked about cargo and electric bike provision. And I noticed that it says that. Uh, there should be provision on a proportionate basis. Um, I'm obviously particularly concerned about that because if there is cargo and electric bike provision, there is mobility scooter and power chair provision. Uh, and this is an area popular with elderly residents. So um, I'm just asking, what does proportionate basis actually mean? And if the officer could explain what is actually being proposed on the site. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Okay, um, I just want to add a bit more to what's been said about the cycle provision by Councillor Thornborough. So um, it would appear that, I mean, there is a, an access gate from plot one to plot two at the back. It would appear that the implication is that the owner of the land, i.e. plot two, wishes to keep ownership of the land on plot one to get access across that land for bins and bikes. And I suppose that's pr their prerogative. But uh, as Councillor Thornborough has said, it's not, not, unless it's organised properly, it's not going to work very well necessarily. So anything you can say about that would be useful, I think. 
Alice, any more questions? No, okay, over to you then, Alice, please. Which is Alice, isn't it, on this one? Yeah, Alice. Thank you, Chair. Um, you should just get up the visuals as well. So um, in terms of linked dwelling, um, it is an attached dwelling. Um, yes, you're right, Councillor Smart. It's um, not linked internally to the existing house. It is a separate dwelling. It's just attached to the existing house. So just to clarify that. Um, in terms of the um, tree, let me just um, share uh, Google Maps to show you what I mean. So um, this is uh, Google imagery from September 2020. You'll see that there is a tree here. Um, when I went to site, um, this um, had obviously been removed. Um, it's no longer there. Um, as um, shown in my site photos, which I'll just get up now. Just bear with me a second. So you'll see from these photos, the tree is no longer there. Um, so that's just to clarify that. In terms of um, landscaping to the front door, um, which is something that was mentioned, um, as has already been identified, we do have a hard and soft landscaping condition and that can um, cover that off in that, um, under that condition. Obviously, um, this uh, arrangement whereby um, there's a shared section of pathway and then it diverts to front doors, that's quite common um, in new developments. But I, I take the point um, that was raised. Um, and um, obviously, uh, if we increase the paving, we'll, inc we'll decrease the amount of um, greenery and soft landscaping um, on that frontage. So I think it is about it's about balance, but I, I take the point on board and, and we can um, consider that when discharging that condition if necessary. Um, in terms of the uh, bin and bike store, yes, the, the bike store and bin store for the um, existing dwelling um, number 108 um, is accessed um, via um, this uh, rear access via Hobart Road. Um, which can also be accessed via their garden. Um, this area here is wide enough to um, drag bins and um, walk with a cycle, um, even when there is a car, parked car here. Um, in terms of convenience, um, I consider that um, obviously Whilst it's not at the front, um, which would be more convenient, there isn't enough space at the front to accommodate um, it alongside um, the existing car parking space um, for the host dwelling. Hence why it's been um, put in the rear garden. Um, and this is considered an acceptable um, provision. Um, in terms of um, boundary treatments, um, there isn't uh, a condition which um, I, I don't believe there is a condition and um, I don't know I don't think it's uh, included within the hard and soft landscaping condition um, to erect boundary treatments prior to occupation of the dwellings um, but I can um, add that if members um, would like that to be added to the consent um, in terms of overlooking to Hobart Road um, arising from the dormer addition um the the dormer here um this dormer um can be erected uh, without planning permission under permitted development um class b um as we're not in the conservation area so um whilst i appreciate that um there may be concerns in terms of additional windows overlooking um the property at hobart road um, this can be done without planning permission. Moreover, um, the the windows here would have um, the principal outlook onto this flank wall 
um, of Hobart Road. So I don't believe that this is going to be a harmful impact. Um, in terms of um, restricting the utility um, in the main in in the host house to be a ha to not be a habitable room, it it is um, obviously internal works. Um, we've got to assess the plans on on the plans. Well, we've got to assess the proposal and the plans that have been submitted. Um, and on the basis that it is a utility room serving the kitchen dining area. Um, so that is what we have done. In terms of the roof heights of the usable space, um, let me just get up this roof plan. So um, obviously with the dormer, the host dwelling um, will have a bedroom at um, in the attic and um, the first floor, uh, the first floor, the other dwelling, so the new new dwelling, the attached dwelling, um, would not have a room at, at uh, attic level, but obviously would have access to an attic. Um, this is not proposed to be a habitable space. Um, and obviously, um, you know, head heights, et cetera, will be covered under building regulations. Um, in terms of the cargo bike storage, um, the uh, bike stores are 2.2 metres in length. Um, so I consider that this would be um, typically, you know, sufficient to accommodate a cargo, a cargo bike if needed. Um, our policy um, does say that um, they should be provided on a proportionate basis and this development is just for one additional dwelling. Um, although I do ap appreciate that um, uh, members may want um, all bike storages to have the capability of um, kind of accommodating cargo and electric bikes. As I said, this this um, these bike stores are 2.2 metres in length, so I do think that they would be able to accommodate um, a cargo bike. And then I think that's everything, but do let me know if it's not. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much. Uh, so I think a couple more things still. And the last round of questions, I think, councillors on this. So I'll go first. So. Um, uh, there was one part of the tree that's not there anymore, which you never answered, Alice, but come back to it with the other questions. So really the question is, uh, did it have a tree preservation order on it? And is there any enforcement action which would affect our consideration of this item? Other questions are Councillor Thornborough. The description of this application is clear that it, there is a new to a new uh, dwelling and I think it's very I don't think the information is clear where the boundaries are for this new dwelling and it there are policies which are explicit for new dwellings which re regarding immunity parking safety inclusive design refuse bicycles that I think are I have concerns about you can't sir. Yes, Councillor Pora. Thank you, Chair. Firstly, could I just check the, the large tree at the front that's remaining? We don't currently have a kind of root protection zone condition or anything, and I'd rather like that to be included if the officer would admit it, because that is a substantial specimen. I think that could be affected by the works considerably, and I don't want the loss of that tree. Second question is, I think when we calculate biodiversity net gain, we can include the tree that was recently removed. Am I right in thinking that? Be grateful for clarification because obviously it's really important when this does get discharged further down the line that it is noted that that tree was there previously. Though I understand it's not protected, obviously they were within their rights to do that. The final thing is picking up on the cycle store for the existing dwelling. Would it not just be sensible to put a gate in the back um, wall that appears to go onto the little pathway behind. I appreciate that's not a material reason for objection per se, but could we at least ensure that that is picked up by officers? Because it does seem a bit strange to route them through another property when 
from my understanding of the plans, there is a, an alleyway at the back, which I'm assuming was designed for exactly that. Because what we wouldn't want to see is the bins and the bikes being left out on the road because the other property owner or tenant blocks the access through. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor, what's that word? Um, I apologise about this, but this is on the usable space in the top floor bedrooms, on the existing and the ex existing house and the new house. There's a dotted line um, on each of the bedrooms, and I and I, I just wonder what the dotted line was. Um, and the other thing I wanted to ask, EV chargers, has that been included? Um, I know that's standard now for new dwellings. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Okay, Alice, back to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, in terms of the tree to the rear, um, hang on, let me just get a plan up to identify what I mean. So um, this tree here um, was not TPO'd, it's not in the conservation area, and so it wasn't protected, so it did not need permission to be removed. Um, there isn't a tree in this front um, front garden, as you can see. Um, they are proposing a tree in the front garden, um, and that will be obviously covered within the hardened soft landscaping um, details, which will be submitted and approved in writing um, with us before um, the works are then carried out. Um, in terms of the boundaries, um, let me just share my screen again to show the site plan. Bear with me a second. So, um, <clears throat> granted it's quite small, let me just enlarge it a little bit. So, um, the boundary fencing proposed is along this uh, boundary here and along this boundary here. <clears throat> um, so, um, they they do show boundary uh, treatments um, on the proposed plans. Um, in terms of whether um, those could be altered, um, I'm sure that we could add a condition if members would like to, um, and if they were minded to approve the application to um, review the boundary um, treatments um, if necessary. Um, in terms of the root protection zone of the front tree, um, this is a proposed tree. This is not an existing tree. As I said, I think um, previously that will be covered in the hard and soft landscaping condition. Um, with regards to biodiversity net gain, um, the baseline data um, collected for um, to measure the biodiversity net gain of the site will include um, the trees that have been rem been removed. Um, I think it um, includes trees and shrubbery that was removed within five years. Um, but uh, Toby can clarify that in a bit more detail if necessary. Um, and then the uh, dotted line on the attic plan was mentioned. So let me just get that up. Um, so the dotted what the, the dotted line here around the bed, I believe, is um, a measurement for making sure there's sufficient width around the bed to move um, for pedestrian movements. I'm not 100% sure whether they are pedestrian movements, um, which include um, kind of wheelchair um, accessibility um, width as well to allow wheelchair access around the bed um that's that's not clear so unfortunately i can't confirm that at the moment um ev yes there is a condition which secures ev charging um so that will be um secured by condition um it's condition eight 
And then lastly, the cycle store um, was mentioned again, but forgive me, I've forgotten what the points were on that. So if you could remind me, that would be great. Cycle store points, that's the four, or was it the Bombra? One of you. I was, I reiterated my concerns about the access to the cycle store and there had been a previous query about um, cargo bikes um, and off-gauge bikes and the provision of those um, within the stores. Thanks, Councillor. Also, Councillor Poor, you said something different, didn't you, as well? I just said, could we not consider at least asking officers to take forward the option of putting a gate in that back wall which goes out onto the path, which appears to be the path I imagine other residents may use for their bins and bikes, just because that would avoid any conflict over the adjoining property's land. Yep, thank you. So, Alice? Thank you for that clarification. That's been really helpful. Um, in terms of the cargo bikes, I think I mentioned this previously, but the um, the cycle stores are 2.2 metres in length, so I believe that that would be sufficient in length to accommodate cargo bikes, but we do not have a policy that which specifically states that cargo bikes have to be provided on every application. It's on a dis it's on a proportionate basis, and obviously this is for one dwelling, um, one additional dwelling. Um, in terms of whether a gate could be provided in the back wall, um, which uh, is used for bins and supposedly bikes for um, the other uh, properties within the terrace. Um, I mentioned this previously, but um, if members were um, concerned about this, we are more than happy to um, put on a condition um, for boundary treatments um, to be submitted and approved to us prior to occupation, and that could um, feature in that condition if it was deemed necessary by members. So I think we're done then. Yep. So recommendation, please, Toby. Thanks, Alice. Thanks, Chair. So the recommendation is as set out on page 74 of the officer report. That is to approve the application subject to the conditions as set out and subject to an additional boundary treatment condition, which would show delineate um, all private and communal access areas, including the location of um, gates and doors. Toby, all those in favour of that recommendation? Mix in favour, Chair. Against? Abstentions? One abstention. Okay, so the item is approved. Thank you very much. Okay, so now we'll have a break for lunch. Uh, to come back at about ten past one, please, for the next item of the day. Thanks very much, everyone. Good debate.
basically what makes go live on Teams. Um, welcome back, everyone, to the afternoon session. Hope you've all refreshed after a break. So the next item that we're going to consider is an item nine, Prospects Row. Um, so we've got one speaker on this item, uh, Charmaine Hawkins, who's the agent. Tom Gray is the case officer. So I think we're all ready to go. So in that case, um, is Charmaine here? Or ah, hello, hi, well, afternoon. Okay. So um, we'll have the presentation first, then you can say your piece in a minute. Okay, so Tom, if you want to present the item then please first. Thank you, Chair. Can you confirm that you can see my slide? Yes, can do. Thank you. So the following application concerns change of use um, of the existing hairdresser facility and uh, first floor um, extension. The application site is located um, in the Kite Conservation Area. Um, it is a building of local interest and it is uh, situated um, in, the, in the setting of Grade 2 listed buildings shown in pink. So to the southeast is a terrace of Grade 2 listed buildings and to the northwest. Here are the existing and proposed elevations. The um, first floor extension proposes a pitched roof uh, set back from the side and principal elevations whilst retaining the frontage of the existing hairdresser facility. Um, the um, here is a glass balustrade providing amenity space for future residents. And the side of the proposal um, consists of a brick wall and uh, access to the um, residential unit to the side. Here are the existing and proposed uh, basement plans. Um, so the basement comprises living area with two voids here and here providing Daylight. Here is the existing and proposed ground floor plans. See, here is the entrance, and there is um, bin storage to the right as you enter, and there is also a bike store. Here is the proposed first floor plan. and the roof plans existing on the left and proposed on the right. The left hand section, proposed section shows the roof relative to the end of the grade two listed terrace. And the right hand section shows the front of the residential unit. Here are some uh, proposed views submitted by the agent. And some site photos for context. So left hand one is from Elm Street from the west. And this is by the pub opposite from the south. From the neighbouring dwelling, you'd be able to see uh, the roof line of the uh, proposed um, extension. Approximately, it would come where my uh, laser pointer is up to this pipe and come down like so. So the key considerations are the principal development design and impact upon heritage assets, neighbour immunity impacts and future occupiers immunity, cycle revision 
and other matters. Thank you, Chair. Tom, um, so um, Charmaine, if you want to come round to the speaker sort of table in the middle at the back there um, and make yourself comfortable. Welcome. So um, there's a, a sort of buttons on the front of the thing. If you press the right hand button, the red light will come on. That's Thank it. You. Yeah. Thank you. Chair. And you have three minutes to speak. And after half a minute before the end, Bella goes to let you know you're coming to the end of board time. Thank you. Are you ready? All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Charmaine Hawkins of Brighter Planning Consultancy, and I'm speaking on behalf of the applicant, obviously in favour of the scheme. Um, and given that the officer is recommending for approval, I'm trying to keep it as brief as possible. Uh, I'm reinforcing the key points of the scheme. Firstly, the change of use. Um, the loss of a retail unit is not contrary to policy in this location and could actually be done as permitted development. Um, change of use from Class E to Class C3 under the GPVO. For clarification, the hairdressing business is relocating outside the city centre rather than closing down. Secondly, the design of the extension. This has evolved in negotiations with your officers such that all the parties are now satisfied this is an acceptable means of extending the building. The setback location of the extension ensures it's subservient visually to the existing ground floor part of the building. The use of zinc cladding echoes materials used on buildings in the area, including the maltings to the northeast of the site. It is stressed that the majority of the new surfaces that are being formed to the roof area will be finished as green walls and green roofs, with the use of zinc being secondary to this. The impact on heritage assets. It is acknowledged that the site is in a sensitive location in the conservation area and adjacent to the terrace of listed buildings. Its existing structure is a BLI. The impact assessment within the uh, submitted heritage statement, which supports the application, um, considered that the actual level of harm resulting would be less than substantial and to a very low end of this category. Public benefits have been identified resulting from the proposals, including finding a new compatible optimum use for the building, and also the biodiversity gain, the use of the green walls and roof on the site, which will result in a net biodiversity gain for the site. The residential amenities of the unit itself, the space created in the property exceeds the council standards for both habitable space and adequate amenity area. Potential noise from the public houses adjacent to it is being addressed by an alternative means of ventilation other than opening windows, which is seen as acceptable to the environmental health officer. The impact on existing residents, the scale and orientation of the extension has been correctly assessed by your officers as not resulting in any harm to the amenities of the adjacent properties, and it is seen as being fully compliant with the local plan. We therefore ask that you follow the officer's recommendation and support the application. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Charmaine. You can stay there if you want or go and sit back where you are. It's up to you. Don't mind. Um, debate, councillors. I think this is a really interesting design. Um, um, I you know, it's a good reuse of, a, of an interesting building in the conservation area, I think, um, and done sensitively. I mean, glad that the pre-app process has worked well. I, My only concern might be the ground floor bedroom and um, are, can, a, can windows open so that it can get natural ventilation? I know the old doorway that recessed off the footpath is... Um, part of has light to the bedroom and then we've got the old um, shop window to the bedroom um, is could the doorway or is there, is there opening lights or could it be could the existing joinery be adapted so that it had natural ventilation in a safe way thank you Ms. Councillor I 
Okay, now this is a conversion, I understand that, but I am worried about the private amenity. I mean, there's no garden or outdoor space. Um, and similarly, you know, how far it can comply with N42. Uh, yeah, and and I also I I also rather disagree with the point eight seven four. Um, it's this is going to be well Prospect Row is very narrow. It's going to be very tight for delivery of building materials and the construction. So if you could just sort of talk a bit more about construction management plan. Uh, I think that is needed. Um, and, yeah, I'd like more details on the ventilation system um, and energy. I think there is something on in here on energy, but uh, and I appreciate that solar panels may not be um, the right thing on this site. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, okay, so... Uh, somewhat agree with the third party representations. I can't quite agree completely with the idea that it couldn't be developed as residential development. I think in this particular instance I'm not so in favour of what I can see. Um, I mean I remember when that shop was a general store shop and kids from Parkside went there to get their sweeties at lunchtime and so on but now that's all gone and now it's hairdressers maybe that will go as well so times do change. However what we see in front of us, I'm not taken in by the fuzzy lines of charcoal and the, the dotted bits of greenery all over it um, as the existing is, is drawn in hard pencil as if somehow they're different things whereas they're not really. So that's the first thing to say. Um, uh, what I can see in front of me is a building that looks rather ugly and detracts from the beauty of the Grade 2 listed buildings adjacent to it. The idea that it somehow relates to the zinc cladding on the Maltings, which is a new develop, very new development, is true, in, strictly speaking, but the Maltings are not a beautiful development. They're just a commercial development using the space as efficiently as possible. And the zinc cladding on those buildings is not particularly uh, good looking, I think. So, ugly is the word I'd use to describe it. Um, I feel that the, it, it's, um, uh, it overpowers number one prospect row with the sort of height of it above the back garden of one prospect. My kids used to play with kiddies in those houses because I live locally. And I know that those gardens at the back of Prospect Row houses are very, very small, they're very narrow. They're wide but narrow, so they do need their open space at the back. And I feel it will detract from their amenity. So, all in all, I'm not very keen on what I can see. Any answers? I was also a bit worried, I know there is an existing basement, but I notice in it, it says there's a gully, and I'm just worried about, uh, and I think it's noted in, in the report, ventilation and dampness in the um, hose basement. And I'm also worried about light. Okay. okay, so back to the Office of Anton. Thank you, Chair and Councillors. Um, I'll try and answer the questions as best I can. Uh, the ventilation, um, as I understand it, uh, the there is a condition um, requiring any alterations to existing windows um, to be provided to uh, the uh, local planning authority before any works are undertaken in terms of um, adjusting any of the windows. There is a condition re um, requiring mechanical ventilation um, in, in the in case um, the pub use um, uh, future future complaints arise from patrons using that pub use. Um, however, there isn't any objection uh, from the environmental health officer 
uh, in regarding noise impacts. So that's the only thing I would say in terms of um, making the only uh, the only option being um, open wall windows without possibility of mechanical ventilation. Um, the outside space wise, um, there is a green roof terrace proposed uh, on the first floor um, uh, to the to the front of that property. Um, the M42 requirements, there is level access from the um, street um, uh, providing um, uh, level access in accordance with M42, um, given that it's um, not um, if you, given that it's not an, a brand new building and there's no requirement in terms of lift access and such like. Um, the construction management plan, um, in my in my view, given the very minor alterations proposed um, and the modest extension, um, it would not be reasonable in my view, but um, it is up to members if they are minded to approve it. Um, uh, we could condition a construction management plan um, as an additional condition on any consent granted. Uh, the energy um, use, um, there is a proposed um, additional uh, glazing, um, a be better glazing than is proposed, than, than is existing at the moment, and that will uh, provide a better, better film insulation for the property. Um, again, there's no requirement um, for um, uh, carbon reduction, uh, given that it's conversion of um, of a, a existing use. Um, I think those were the questions. I hope I've covered everything. If not, come back to me. No, Tom, they, were, they weren't all questions, obviously. Um, did anything get Miss Councillors um, Thornborough? Yeah, one of uh, Jenny Gorthrop Wood's question, I think, about natural light down to the basement. Is that covered? So lighting, Tom, yeah. uh, down to the basement, as Councillor Thornborough said, it might also, I think we were also referring to light um, that might or might not be cut off to number one prospect way by the extension going up. And, um, and also, just while I'm on it, I'm a bit surprised at your thoughts about that, that corner of Prospect Row, for, you know, Street Prospect Row, that corner is a nightmare to go around in vehicle access and cars, vehicles, taxis, they're all going that way. Um, if there's vehicles there building a site out, even if it's a small site, it seems to me that's going to be really difficult. To you, Tom, to reply to that. Okay. In terms of uh, natural daylight, um, given that it's uh, given that there's multiple living areas, I don't, I don't believe that it is going to be um, uh, substandard light in there. But obviously, that will be covered in terms of building regulations. Um, in terms of lights, impacts upon. The adjacent property number one, it's a, in my view, it's a it's a very modest um, roof um, roof extension in terms of what can be seen from that um, from that adjacent property. Um, therefore, they have provided a shade study to demonstrate what the impacts would be, and it's negligible. Um, and construction management plan um, again, I I, I can't I can, you know, that is a condition that could be attached if members um, feel that is reasonable and necessary. OK, that's great. Thanks, Tom. Toby's just going to say something about light now. Yeah, I just wanted to come back on the, the, the light, having kind of looked at the plans, Tom. I don't know if you're able to pull up the cross section, but it, it shows actually that some thought has been given to bringing light into all levels of the unit through a kind of um, full length kind of void at the at the back of the unit and a and an internal kind of light well at ground floor into the basement so there's a, there's a cross section on the plans certainly in the plans pack that I'm looking at Tom that is um, quite helpful if 
you have that. So the one on the, the left hand side. Then okay. Any more questions, councillors? No. So just to be clear, councillors, my gripe with it is I could still, in terms of design, the look of it, however you want to call it, what words you want to use, I don't, I don't think it's good. Um, I always try to approach items on planning in that way. I want the city to look beautiful. I want buildings to look beautiful. I don't feel this is one of them, but that's not the only thing to be considered here. There are many, many other things to weigh up and make a decision on. Uh, Councillor Wolf Rockwood. I'm sorry, I can't remember, but it is in, it's in the report. What colour will the zinc end up looking uh, once it's weathered? And also, for heating methods, can you remind me what method will be used? Councillor uh, Katon, could you answer that one, please? Yeah, in terms of the zinc cladding uh, colour, um, it is unknown at this stage. However, there is a condition requiring um, details of the what what zinc is to be used. I think that's condition uh, six of the recommendation. Um, uh, let me just check what um, heating system they are proposing. Uh, so it's by an electric boiler. Let's go back on that. That's yeah, I, I noticed that in several reports you refer now nowadays you're referring to electric boilers. Is this an air source heat pump? Or does this mean that you've got water tanks that a boiler is? Heating up. So, how's the boiler um, powered? Thank you. Well, I'm presuming it's an electric immersion, but anyway, Tom, do you, were you able to answer that or not? It doesn't appear to be an air source heat pump, otherwise, they, it'd be shown on the plans. I, I believe it's uh, it, the source is electric. Any more questions, councillors? No? Okay, turn your microphone off, please, Councillor Crawford. Thank you. So, can we have the recommendation, then, please, Toby? Thanks, Chair. So, the recommendations on page ninety-five of the officer report, and that is to approve subject to the planning conditions as set out. Thank you, Toby. All those in favour of that recommendation? Five in support, Chair. One is against. One against. Thank you. Extensions. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah okay, sure. right. So the item is approved. Thank you very much. Thanks to the speaker. And thanks, Tom. So we go on to the next item now, which is uh, not the Cambridge Nuclear and Pool Centre, which has been withdrawn from the agenda. So the next one is 611 Newmarket Road. Are no public speakers on this item. So, uh, President of the Planning Officer is Nick Hager. So, Nick, when you're ready. Nick, just hold on, we'll sort of, I mean, I think this is your end, I can't hear you. I just wanted to check with the, with the chair that my screen is um, shared correctly. That we can see the screen and hear you, thank you. Thank you. 
Um, so this is the demolition of the existing house and the erection of eight flats and one masonette. Net eight new homes together with auxiliary works. This is at 611 Newmarket Road, Cambridge. The application is brought to the committee because of third party comments. Officers are asking members for the recommendation to the planning inspectorate of dismissal. So um, updates on the amendment sheet. The recommendation is incorrect. The application is at appeal for non-determination. Therefore, the council can no longer determine that application. Instead, officers are asking for members for the recommendation to the planning inspectorate to dismiss the appeal. The recommendation of page one, power 1 1.5, power 9.80 and power 10.1 are incorrect. Officers are asking me members to endorse the recommendation to the planning inspectorate to dismiss the appeal. So um, follow to allow for the consult expiry of the consultation period, the um, an extension of time was agreed. A second extension of time was asked by officers to um, be granted to allow to take before this committee. However, the applicant did not agree and in instead um, appealed by by non determination. The application site is located here, um, shown within the red. So this is the dwelling to be demolished. And there's also a warehouse located approximately here that will be uh, removed and <clears throat> replaced with the flats. This is a wider stonemasonry business um, that is that is currently in use. The access will be located along this path here off New Market Road, and there's also a pedestrian access located here. So the aerial photography, um, this can show the extent of the surrounding stonemasonry business. Um, there is a funeral directors located here. Um, this application will see the removal of, of this, this, this dwelling here and also part of, of this warehouse located here. Um, so re relevant planning history. Um, this application is similar as a resubmission of a previous application, which was refused on the 30th of 11th, 2021 and is currently being um, assessed at appeal. Um, I will go through some of the differences between this application and the last one throughout the presentation. So the previous reasons for refusal, which is now appeal, were the overlooking impacts to the neighbouring property of 609 Newmarket Road, failing to provide adequate private and communal amenity space, noise impact assessment, lacking detail and clarity due to the surrounding stonemasonry in use, bin storage arrangements, inadequate cycle storage, and it was considered an overdevelopment. This is a, a, an artist um, aerial shot showing the buildings that will be removed in the in the dark red. The light grey show the existing wider use of the site and the dark grey show the existing, which will remain as the existing stonemasonry business and the funeral directors located here. Um, so this is just a shot showing um, some of the visuals of, of within the site currently. Um, so that's looking towards towards Newmarket Road. That's that's some of the, the warehouse and this is some of the, the masonry. So the proposed site plan would see a masonette located here, the vehicle access into the site located along here, a pedestrian footpath and cycle plan located here, amenity spaces for the units located here, a three storey and two storey um, flat block located here, parking arrangements and a communal area here. This is uh, the roof plan, so showing green roofs located here and some of the amenity spaces here and the communal space and the parking arrangements. This is the ground floor plan showing that the ground floor flats have access to some of the amenity spaces. There would be a plant room, a bike store and a bin store located up here. First floor plan shows two bed. Again, all of these units are two bedroom flats. Um, there would be on first floor, they would have balconies presented here on the western elevation. And these would have um, access upon it. Um, and this is the second floor, so um, two bedroom flats, with balconies accessing on, and a lift here. These are the posed masonettes floor plan. So the ground floor, bin storage, cycle storage, a hall, 
and then um, bedroom one and bedroom two. Um, the posed masonette would sit like this within the street scene, so sat within the neighbouring property and within that existing front of the, the stone masonry or the shop front as well. Uh, the flat elevations would have a significant amount of openings on the western elevation with the balconies projecting outwards at first, second floor. The masonette located here. On the eastern elevation, which would face upon the funeral director and the stone masonry would be located as such here. The western elevation would face upon the um, residential amenity. The north elevation would be fa facing in front of the site towards the stone masonry and the southern elevation would be facing back um, back towards the, um, the warehouse. So the artist has submitted some visual representations um, that shows the masonette sat within in this context, moving her along the masonette there and the block of plaques there. This is the western elevation, so this would be facing a ward towards the res uh, residential amenity, which show that these number of openings of balconies here, and this would be the, the eastern elevation facing towards the, the more commercial use. So the to dismissal reasons, um, we're looking again, we've got concerns with the overlooking impacts on neighbouring property 109 due to the multiple openings and balconies. Fails to provide um, adequate um, private and immunity space of sufficient high standard and quality. The sub submitted noise impact assessment lacking clarity and detail, concerns residing bin storage and refuge. Um, no visitor cycle storage and insufficient information that um, the pro cycle storage can achieve within the guidance. Um, and then lack of information proposal not considered to part with um, the building regs of part M42 of the building regulations and therefore together it's considered an overdevelopment of the site. So the previously refused layout which have access to appeal you know it's not all of these did contain amenity areas um, and it didn't contain a communal area to the north here. If I now show what what we have um, being assessed is the communal areas located up near the car park. These are two bedroom flats, so it's considered that this isn't sufficient quality or or space enabled to allow children to play or sufficient communal area as it's quite cramped and contrived up near the parking area. Um, cycle storage, no visitor to cycle storage has been provided. There's no detailed plan showing um, that the cycle storage could be achieved um, and the cam cycle raised concerns with the aisle width of some of the some of the um, stands to the right. Um, we still have concerns regarding the overlooking impacts of, of these with the still sufficient um, significant amount of openings at the balconies which would look upon this garden which was the main reason for refusal as well. Um, we've got concerns regarding the bin storage location and the transport of that and the distance from the masonette. And also the environmental health officer has raised that there's still not enough information and there needs to be more clarity on the noise um, in, at the noise report. The reason for that is due to the surrounding um, commercial stone masonry use. Um, I wanted to show this aerial shot. Um, so another concern regarding the amenity space for the masonette is this area here that was also brought up in, in the last refusal that this is sort of seems that uh, in connection with the existing um, uh, commercial in, well, industrial use and there's openings within this area that, that would not be a good quality for the applicants um, they, for the um, occupiers of the masonet um, to enjoy. So these are the previously refused elevations. Um, please note the Westing elevation which raises the concerns over the, the neighbouring property. There was balconies located here and here and at two and three storey that would look upon the, the neighbouring garden. Um, it's noticed that these balconies have been slightly shifted and, and curved around with, with these elements. However, there still are sufficient amount of windows and, and areas that you could look upon at uh, first, second floor that would look directly upon the neighbouring property of 689's garden. Um, Another reason for refusal, um, dismissal rather, sorry, is the details of the um, access. So not all above um, ground flats have um, access. So flat three pointed out here doesn't. Um, the lift contained here would only access 
um, this um, flat five, flat floor, and the, the floor above that, but wouldn't wouldn't access flat three. And the access officer asked for some details regarding the lift size as well, which, which we haven't been provided. Um, just a few photographs showing the site. So that's the existing the existing dwellings that would be um, demolished for the masonette. And this is the existing rear of the site. So you'd have a three storey um, flats here that would look upon into into this garden here. And this is actually from the neighbouring 609's window. So that would be replaced by a, a fairly large structure, the three storey that would again look in, look upon here and the two storey as well about here. That would um, the first storey, sorry, and two storey here and first storey here that would look upon the neighbouring garden. Um, again, showing the, the overlooking impacts that would that would be predicted by this. The final photograph on that. Um, so there was an objection received from the neighbouring property and there was a support comment received from flat 1, 601 Newmarket Road. Um, the balance and planning balance conclusion and um, the development will lead to material harm to residential immunity and conflict with local plan policy. Proposal play, fails to provide adequate cycle and bin storage un for all units, does respect the residential occupiers in the neighbouring property, is therefore the um, it's considered an overdevelopment of the site. The higher density of accommodation with, air, with the area on a previously brownfield site um, contrib contribution to the local economy and um, provision of some local jobs and local additional spend. So that's some of the supporting here and that's some of the against. Um, taking into account um, is considered the um, against outweigh the, the support of, of the local jobs and the um, increased density of the um, brownfield site which is why we're asking our members for the recommendation to dismissal. Um, that is my end of my presentation. I'll go back to the chair. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Thanks very much. Uh, so no speakers, so debate. So before we start, I just like to con congratulate officers on their diligence in considering this item. It's been a very good report. Well done. And um, yeah, is there any debate or should we go straight to the decision? And just a question. Do, so, does the the refused application? Are they? There's an appeal against the refused application, and there's an appeal on this application. Thank you, Councillor. We'll get an answer to that, Councillor Pora. Thank you. I'm very much in agreement with the officer recommendation, or rather, the suggestion that we agree uh, with the revised one. Could I just check the details of? The problem with the immunity space for the maze and X. It says it appears to be owned by, or it says it's currently in connection with 613 Newmarket Road. And I just wanted to note paragraph six of the refusal seems to have been a little bit of cut and paste gone wrong because it said absent this information. I think it means in the absence of this information. Um, just um, a bit, just it just needs rewording slightly. I think it's been cut and paste slightly wonkily. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Councillor. I'll go back to you then, Tom. So on the question of appeal, um, there is a I was a previous refusal on this site, which was then um, which the applicant has appealed um, due to the applicant um, not wishing to agree an extension of time. They've also appealed by non-determination um, as I asked for an extension of time to take it before into September to take it to, to this very committee, um, which they didn't agree and therefore they appealed by non-determination. So in theory, there are a two two appeals running at this site, and therefore we're asking members for the recommendation um, for for dismissal. Um, and and this, the second question regarding the um, amenity space of the masonette, I can just show you. Um, I'll share my screen again very quickly. It just it's quite handy seeing this. Um, aerial photographs. So I think what the concerns were with the last application and this is that this appears to be a yard that's... Are you able to use your laser pointer in it? Yes, of course. If you can, it's yeah. much better to see that. Yeah. Directly. Thanks. Don't worry, 
sorry, Nick, if it's not possible, we'll just focus on the area. OK, um, sorry, it's still a technical and difficult. As essentially, this area here seems to be a, a yard or in connection with this ex in this existing um, industrial use of the stone masonry. And the concern is that there's a number of openings or as such that would be leading on to here um, surrounding this. So the, the, the part of the reason for refusal is that this would be in a private amenity area for the Masonette, except it would be quite a poor quality due to the surrounding industrial area with the openings of the industrial use and, and the noise and disturbance from it surrounding it. Um, I hope that, that answers that question. And then with regards to the, um, the paragraph in the report, um, I believe you are quite correct. It, it would it would have been a typing error um, of, of myself when writing the report that, that I missed that of the cut and paste, but it's, it's the insufficient information. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. Um, does everyone understand what's in front of them, what's going on in terms of the appeals and so on? Do we need any more information from Nick or Toby? We're all good. Okay, in that case, let's have the recommendation then, please, Toby. Thanks, Chair. So the recommendation is set out on page two of the amendment sheet, and that is to ask members to endorse the officer and recommendation and request to the planning inspectorate that the application be dismissed. Those in favour of that recommendation? That's unanimous, Chair. Thank you very much. So that is a recommendation is approved. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick. In that case, let's go on to the next item, I think, everyone. Yes, OK. So the next one is 19 Fortescue Road. Uh, no public speakers on this item. And it's you again, Nick, on this one. So I think you're all good to go. Yes, so if you want to present the item then, please, Nick. Okay, this is at 19 Port Rescue Road. Um, just, just a minute, Nick, just before you go on. So just to be clear, as everyone has probably seen in the report, this is only in front of us because it's a member of the planning service, so we have to look at it. So keep it brief, Nick. There's, there's no need to spend a long time on this item. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's yeah, recommended for approval by officers, and it's for a single-story front extension. Um, the location plan shows a semi-detached um, dwelling uh, located on Fortescue Road. No site constraints. Um, this area here is for the single story front extension located upon nine, number 19 on the block plan. Um, so the existing front elevations, so um, typical dwelling, and it would have a fairly typical or um, single story front extension located in front or like a like a large porch with such an extension. Um, so this is the area showing the floor plans and it would just be this area here. That is the um, extension. Um, no third party comments, no comment on behalf of the highway, no site constraints. Um, and this is the site, so there's just be a port lo located up on here. Some more shots. And I just had a shot, just a couple of doors down, so has a very similar proposal with what, what we have that would be located upon here. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Nick. So I think you've said it all, Nick, but basically a front porch uh, by a member of the planning service. There are no representations on this item from me members of the public or from councillors. So is there any debate? No. In that case, let's go to the recommendation then, please, Toby. Thanks, Chair. So the recommendations on page 145 of report and that is to approve the planning application subject to the conditions as set out. Thanks Toby, all those in favour of that recommendation? That's all Chair. That is approved, thank you very much. Thanks Nick. So I think this is the next one, everyone looks happy as far as I can see. So, oh right, it's three works now, okay, so number 13. Does anyone need a break by the way? Okay, right. Okay, three works, item 13. So, um, uh, hi, Joanna. Good afternoon. Hello. So, 
Uh, Officer John Davis, no public speakers. There are kids, public speakers. Yes, there are public speakers on this item. So um, I've got Jane Howard Jones or Trevor Hollinger. So it might be Trevor. Um, and then we've got Sam, uh, Councillor Carling, City Ward Councillor. And we've also got Councillor Scott as well. So I can see, no, I can't. Anyway, we'll expect to see those people later. So um, let's have the presentation first then, Joanna, if we may. Thank you, Chair. Um, this is an application to carry out works to two trees. The application seeks permission for the removal of a false acacia and a crown reduction of a silver birch, both trees being located in the rear garden of 76 de Frevel Avenue. Um, the um, <clears throat> officers are satisfied that there is sound arboricultural justification for the removal of T1, given the extent of decay located in the lower canopy and the associated risk of structural failure, but officers are not satisfied that there is sound justification for a crown reduction. Um, we have received um, objections, a number of objections to the removal of T1, and this is the reason that the application is coming before committee. The recommendation is to um, approve the removal of T1, the false acacia, subject to replacement planting, but refuse the crown reduction of T3, a silver birch. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Joanna. So, uh, speakers, so do we have Jane Howard Jones or Trevor Hollinger? Oh, you're hearing. Sorry, I was expecting to see you on screen. I apologise. Perhaps you want to take a seat in the back then. Is that okay? There's a, a light microphone there again. Great. So, Jane, I thought we saw Trevor Hollinger on screen earlier, but he's not speaking then. Is that right? Do you know, or is that just a different person you're not aware of? Uh, oh, you're here as well, Trevor. Are you? I see. Thank you for explaining. Okay. So just for people listening, um, that wasn't in the microphone. So uh, Trevor said that he wasn't going to be speaking to the item, but Jane is going to be speaking. So, and I apologise for looking at the screen and everything. Got so used to looking at the computers now, I forget to look at people sometimes. So you're here in the room, so that's good. So um, you've got three minutes to speak, Jane, and you press the right hand button in front of you on the microphone, and the, light, the red light will come on. And then half a minute before the end, the bell will go to let you know you're coming to the end of your time. Three minutes. All right, when you're ready. Can you hear me okay? Good afternoon. My name's Jane Howard Jones. On behalf of the nine immediate neighbours, I wish to object to the chopping down of the beautiful T1 acacia. By way of history, a TPO was placed on this tree by the council on the 6th of June of this year, but only three weeks later, a proposal to chop down this tree was submitted. The basis for this proposal was that the tree, and I quote, looks to be decayed near the top, therefore there is a risk of failing. There are three strong reasons not to fell this tree. Firstly, we have two independent assessments obtained recently when the council site inspection report was not made available. These two independent reports confirm that the tree is not decayed and not at risk of failing. They confirm the tree is healthy. Secondly, this tree is a valuable public amenity that can be clearly appreciated from the surrounding streets. Beaver Road, Humberstone Road, Bowlands Close and Frevel Avenue. The tree is not completely enclosed by houses. It is visible because there is a mix of properties from single storey bungalows to flats. Thirdly, if there is any decay, which we are not convinced of, a crown reduction would still enable this tree to continue to be a public amenity as it would be still over six metres high. If there was a need for repruning, the experts say this is only needed every four to five years along with standard annual assessment for mature trees. In summary, my points are that the two alternative assessments advise that the tree is healthy. There is no doubt that this tree is a valuable public amenity and if necessary, it can be maintained by pruning. 
We have two asks of the committee. Firstly, to refuse the proposal to chop down this beautiful T1 acacia as a tree is healthy and it can be preserved. Alternatively, as our two independent assessors saw no evidence of damage or decay, we ask the committee to defer the decision. This would allow an assessment made by an expert who is granted permission to climb the tree and conduct a closer assessment. We don't believe this has been done and specifically they could assess any maintenance requirements such as pruning. The extent of feeling by local neighbours concerning this historic tree has been a call to action in relation to this significant public amenity. In summary, we ask the planning committee not to condemn this healthy, mature tree, the T1 acacia, which has taken over 50 years to grow, is loved by many and enriches our neighbourhood. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jane. Thanks for that. You can stay there if you want or sit in the side wherever you prefer. Um, but you can't enter into the debate now, going forward. Uh, so, Councillor Carling, you seem to be on screen. I can see your initials. So, are you ready to speak now? Um, I am, Chair. Thank you. Oh, hello. Are you going to put your oh, yeah, you got the camera on. Good. Okay. Welcome. Good afternoon. So, um, when you're ready. Thank you. Just before I start, I'm not sure if Councillor Scott's been detained at work. I'm aware she was also registered to speak, but she may not be able to make it. Um, so many residents have written to Councillor Scott and I about these trees, and I'm really glad to see that the officer's recommendation does recommend refusal of permissions to crown the birch tree T3. I would urge the committee to support that part of the application, uh, that part of the recommendation, excuse me, to refuse the application. As the officer's report sets out in paragraph 3.3 .3 on page 148, the applicant originally wanted to fell six trees on the property, but when it became clear that we wouldn't allow that to happen, settled for trying just two. That context is critical here. This application isn't about safety, it's about somebody wanting to get rid of trees in the garden for other reasons, despite the immense contribution to the character of the area and the residential amenity that they provide. On the state of the tree, as Mrs Howard Jones highlighted, residents have had two independent assessments of the tree's condition carried out, and the view that came back from both was that the tree is in good condition. Unfortunately, we weren't able to submit that evidence for the committee to consider today, as I understand it due to a legal technicality about it not already being in the public domain, but I'm going to summarise their main points. One report was from a forest ecologist that specialises in how trees die, having spent eight years developing regression models for predicting whether a tree would snap, uproot or die standing. He has published four peer-reviewed scientific papers on the subject, and his opinion of the tree we're calling T1 is that there is no outward sign predicting bow failure or anything else that would raise safety issues. To use his words, the tree is healthy and in fine form. The other report from a qualified tree surgeon explains that while there is a small diameter of deadwood throughout the crown, this is because of shading rather than dieback or decay. He says the crown appears healthy and of normal vigour, leaf size and colour, and that the proximity to the property is not a problem in his professional opinion. He goes on to suggest a clear plan to manage the tree by reducing the regrowth to form a smaller, more compact crown, if indeed there is any decay, and from there it would need to be repruned approximately every five years. These reports make it clear that the tree isn't rotting and decayed as originally thought, and therefore to remove it would be in clear violation of local plan policy. I have to disagree with the case officer's report in paragraph 2.1, page 148, that the wider impact as perceived by the public is limited. I would argue that the strength of feeling we have received from our residents and the number of objecting comments on the planning portal is evidence that this is majorly important to the people that live in this area. As such, given the expert opinions garner that the tree is neither a danger nor decaying and the huge amenity value it adds to the area, a conservation area, I would urge the committee to refuse the felling of T1. If the committee is not prepared to do so outright today, then I would join others in asking that the decision be deferred so that another more in-depth analysis of the tree involving climbing up it and looking at it up close could be obtained. Thank you very much. So is Councillor Scott available to speak? Can't see your initials on screen, Councillor Scott, so I presume that you have been delayed as Councillor Carling has suggested, but I think um, we can't wait any longer, so we just have to move forward probably. So I think you've made the points there, Councillor Carling. Um, just to say that I did ask the uh, officers here whether we could hear what Councillor Carling was saying because he was summarising um, very detailed points from a report or reports that are not in the public domain, something that we normally 
refused to see a planning committee because it's not in the public domain. But I was told that we could hear that, so you can um, take note of what was said by Councillor Corling, just to be clear. So in that case, um, debate, councillors. I'll start. So, um, Joanna. So my first thought was liability. If we um, go forward with, uh, sorry, if we refuse your recommendation and leave it as is, and there's some sort of damage occurs, uh, uh, does that mean who's liable for that? Could it be us? And secondly, um, we've been told there are a couple of reports that show the tree to be healthy, contrary to your opinion. Um, have you seen those reports? Are they of interest to us? Should we consider deferring to see those reports? Um, I think those are my two main questions. Anybody else? Anything? No? Okay. Uh, yes, Councillor Gorthup would. Well, it's just following on from what you say. I mean, we're, I think we're being asked to be tree disease diagnosticians here. Um, and that is not my field. Uh, and I can only go on what's presented before me. I haven't seen those two independent reports. I'd like Joanna's view on that. And, and the other thing is on the background, you know, there being originally more trees that the uh, owner wished to, the resident wished to remove. I mean, we can only go on what's in front of us, I think. Sure. I mean, Joanne's just done her report so far, so she'll respond now, and I think it might be something we can come back to, so we can have some more questions afterwards. So, Joanna, over to you. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, with regards to the liability issue, um, yes, if, if we refused permission um, and something did happen, then the council could be considered liable for um, damage, harm, um, if there was a failure. Um, the, the I, I've seen one of the reports, um, it was sent through on Monday, uh, Friday afternoon, but that was too late to be able to get it into the public domain and then allow um, other people to be able to assess it and potentially make comment, um, which was why um, we weren't able to allow it to be included. Um, the report that I saw was the one that was carried out by Acacia. Um, they did confirm that the tree appeared healthy, so that's uh, it's got good vigour, but that's different from decay. They did confirm that there is decay where the previous pruning was carried out, um, and their recommendation was for a crown reduction to make the tree safe. Um, and that that crown reduction would need to be carried out every four to five years. Um, it, that's not all that different from our assessment. The tree was actually assessed by Matthew McGrath, um, who is another tree officer at, um, in the council, He's the senior tree officer. Um, and his assessment was that the reduction required um, in order to make the tree safe would be sufficiently severe as to have a material impact on the contribution that the tree makes to public amenity um, and that therefore there was justification to allow the tree to be removed and replaced. Uh, one of the significant benefits of replacement planting is that a replacement tree would be healthy and could be allowed to grow to maturity, whereas this tree would not be allowed to or should not be allowed to gain the stature that it that it has at the moment. Um, and then the background, there was a, it was actually a conservation area notification. None of the trees were protected by TPO. Um, they were just protected by the conservation area location. The conservation area notification was submitted um, earlier in the year and that was for the removal of a number of trees. Um, two of the trees were not considered to be suitable for tree preservation order um, and they were allowed to be removed but we served a tree preservation order protecting trees that had significant amenity value. The application 
which is an application to remove or work on a tree that is protected by a TPO rather than a conservation area notification. The application was similar in that, in that it was also asking for permission for the removal of T1, the false acacia. Um, and slightly more information was, was provided. Um, the report that was provided with the application was not adequate, which is why officers felt that it was appropriate for a technical officer to visit the tree and assess the tree ourselves in order to be able to um, determine whether or not there was justification for the work. So the first one was a conservation area notification, which resulted in four trees being TPO'd. The second application is an actually an application and that was and that's to remove a tree which was the same um, request as the first one um, but then also to prune a tree and the, the previous notifi notification was to fell that tree also thank you chair thank you very much Shana. very detailed as always uh, I think we've got a couple of questions now to come back to you with. I'll go first. So with regard to T1, the applicant wants to uh, remove the tree. Uh, officers are suggesting that we approve that and uh, uh, allow the removal of said. You said that uh, it's possible, but if we were to see the reports, maybe defer and go forward with that, that it might be the case that instead of removal that um, passing back the tree every four to five years might solve the problem or maybe, you know resolve it let's say um, however this, am, I, am I right in thinking that the applicant has asked to remove the tree uh, normally we don't redesign applications on the table because effectively it seems to be what we're doing we're, we're going back to the applicant saying no don't remove it just cut it every four to five years which is a cost to the applicant a different cost to removal but a cost possibly a greater cost and um, are we are we able to do that I suppose that's my question so Councillor Thornborough has a question as well yep mine was similar to yours chair about if there is a if there is another option I think it needs to be part of an application and it it um, I think the if there are these reports I think it, it seems a shame not to have the full, uh, the officers to have the full time to Look at both the reports, and if there is, if it is possible to um, climb the tree to get a, as suggested, whether that would be appropriate to defer a decision until there is more information, and either to uh, continue with the recommendation or have a third, uh, an alternative recommendation about retaining um, T1 but with a reduction, crown reduction. So. I would suggest, I'd like to suggest that we do defer this application. Thank you, Councillor. So there's a proposal to defer, which will need seconding, but before we, I ask you for a seconder, I'm going to ask uh, Councillor Ford to speak. Thank you very much, Chair. I am happy to second that. That was partly what I was going to say. I think my concern at the moment is we haven't got the full reports. I give significant weight to what Joanna and Matt say. I work with them a lot. My ward is full of trees like this. I'm very well versed in conservation areas versus TPOs versus what planning permission. And I know they do normally work tirelessly within the planning regulations to ensure trees are not taken down unless there's a good reason. Um, however, in terms of sort of natural justice, given that we haven't seen the full reports and equally the owner of the property hasn't either and hasn't had a chance to put in anything, I do feel deferral would be reasonable. And um, I think we do have to be realistic though, because if from what Joanna said, the report commissioned by the residents is also saying the way to deal with this is pollarding or crown reduction to four metres or five metres smaller. I think whatever outcome is not going to be the specimen we've got there. The outcome is gonna be a much, much smaller tree. And might I suggest if it does come back to committee, we could perhaps bring some drawings, which might indicate what that kind of crown reduction would look like. I'm mild. I do a lot of this in my ward council work, so I'm quite, um, I understand how this process works, but I do think we have to be realistic that if the reports coming in suggest that we need a substantial crown reduction, then we're not ever looking at that tree looking as it is. 
the decision is between a much shorter stumpier tree or a replacement. And I think at the moment I'd much rather defer so we have all of that information so Joanna has a chance to look at it, decide whether they agree or not, and if necessary, commission more reports if we need that. So I would second Councillor Thornbrookley. The other thing I just wanted to ask, I noticed that I think para 8.11, there's a suggestion that T1 was reduced substantially by five metres, which has led to some of this damage, which is now leading to the request. Can I just check when that was done? Presumably that was done legitimately before the tree was protected. And did it have permission in the conservation area to do that? Because obviously it worries me a little bit if someone's taken down a part of a tree and then says, oh, I've taken down too much, now it needs to come down. That's not something I'm keen on for obvious reasons. So I'll be grateful for a comment on that just before we defer or vote on deferral. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'll just say one more thing before we go back to you, Joanne, is that uh, it was said earlier that we're not tree experts, which we're not, but we do see trees come to this committee off and on, and we do pick things up along the way. And I know that it can be a problem when you cut a tree back, because that in, in itself can cause a problem. I think the word is heave, I'm not sure, um, which could be an issue here. So we need to be careful what we wish for, really, I think, in terms of how we approach this. But in the end, we need to defer to, defer to officers and their expert opinion or, or the expert opinion of people who are experts, and that could be in reports as well, I guess. So back to you, Joanna. Um, thank you. Um, <clears throat> so, yes, with regard to um, the deferral, um, I have seen the report that was issued by Acacia, and that is the report that recommends that the tree is reduced and that's a, that, that is a significant reduction um, that is in line with the recommendation that was made by Matthew which is that there is decay in the canopy that is sufficiently severe to have compromised the structural integrity of the tree and that remedial work is required to bring the tree back into a reasonable amount of safety um, that is the minimum that is required to make the tree safe. Um, it isn't appropriate for us to change the specification to that. The applicant has requested removal and they need to have the opportunity to appeal against a refusal. Um, if we change the specification, we are denying them their right to appeal against a refusal um, to allow the tree to, to be removed. Um, so I, I wouldn't recommend that. Um, we would normally ask an applicant to make two separate applications if they were happy to consider two alternative solutions. So one application to fell and one application for a crown reduction. Um, the, the location of the decay within the canopy um, does not require a climbing inspection. It's not sufficiently high in the canopy that it can't be seen. There's necrosis um, that is clear um, within the stem. The decay is clear um, with decay pockets is 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 clear, um, and the the regrowth above the de the, the decay pockets um, is significant. So the, the the crown reduction that was carried out historically was relatively low in the canopy. So the regrowth allowing the tree to be the size that it is at the moment, all that regrowth is above weak unions, which is why the recommendation is that the minimum requirement is um, a, a heavy reduction below the point of decay. Um, and that would result in a, in a long-term impact on the amenity contribution of the tree. Um, with regards to heave, um, we we have no control over heave. This 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 wouldn't be a a, a valid consideration in an, in an application like this. There's no um, suggestion that there is subsidence. So there's no suggestion that the tree has impacted on soil moisture levels beneath the property. Um, 
we have no control over heave. Trees are living organisms. They die um, and we can't stop them from dying. So we can't stop them from going. Um, heave is um, inevitable if a tree is to be removed. We would normally only consider the impact of heave in terms of a subsidence case where there is a persistent soil moisture deficit and that remedial work to deal with that persistent soil moisture deficit um, could result in um, additional damage. Um, the work that was carried out that resulted in the in the decay in the tree is historic. Um, I'm not sure when it was carried out, but it was a long time ago and possibly before the conservation area. Um, I think that's it, but if I have forgotten anything. Oh, uh, yes, there, 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 there is a there, there is a cost. We we generally don't consider the cost of tree works um, as a reason to approve or refuse an application. Um, but it, it, you you would be right, Chair, in saying that that there would be a uh, uh, a persistent cost to the applicant because they would need to uh, carry out remedial work um, on a periodic basis. But we do that and other people do that all the time. Th thank you. Thanks, Joanna, I mean, my point there was really with regard to whether we were going to suggest that the applicant should, should cut the tree back as opposed to remove it. And you've already said that that would not be appropriate because the applicants made an application which is on the table today, which is not about cutting back, it's about removal. Um, so I think, unless there's any other questions, it looks like there might be one or two. We need to weigh up the factors and make a decision. Just before we do uh, go to more debate, just to say that um, uh, Councillor Slut, who was unfortunately delayed, um, is, uh, Councillor, you have written in the chat, I believe, comments about the report that's not in the public domain. So I think you need to detract, you know, not do that, please, because we don't have debate in the chat, even by councillors. So, Councillor Cora. Just a really quick point. Given that whether Councillor Thorne will agree, I think actually I've not heard anyone speak against the refusal of the crown reduction of T3. So I wonder if we might take the vote in two parts, i.e. consider deferral for the T1 decision. Um, so at least the applicant knows where we're, but I, again, I'm happy to be corrected by Toby or Joanna if you think that's a bad idea. I just thought nobody seems to be objecting to Joanna's second recommendation relating to T3. Thanks, Councillor. That, that had already been highlighted to me by um, officers, and I'll let Toby respond to that question. I'm sure Joanna will cut across me if I'm wrong, but this is this is one application um, that's that's before us. So I'm not sure mm -hmm. that that will be legitimate <clears throat> process wise to do that. Joanna, I'll defer to you. Um, yeah, we can do a split decision. We do um, split decision so we can say we refuse this um, and uh, we approve one and refuse another. Um, I'm not entirely sure how that works with a deferral. Did I guess? So, uh, councillors, any more points of information you need to make a decision? Councillor Thornborough. So, I did propose a deferral and it was seconded. So, are you, will that be taken forward? Yeah, I haven't forgotten. We'll have a vote on that for sure. Uh, Councillor Bennett, did you have your hand up? Yes. Yeah. Just asking for some clarification for myself, please. Um, which is in connection with T1, I can hear from Joanna's comments that there's quite close agreement between her own report and the Acacia report that there is damage. Uh, and the sort of difference is between what is actually best for the amenity to sort of live with the very heavily pollarded tree or to have a new tree that can have full growth. But there doesn't seem to be any um, support for the idea that the tree can just be left as it is. 
Am I correct in that? Thanks for that, Councillor. Uh, if you want to answer that question, then, Joanna, I guess also answer, perhaps, just give us a number on the following as well. I, I, my guesstimate is it will be 70% cut back. Is that about right? Or could you give us some sort of indication of what, what the following would be? Um, yes. So, firstly, um, yes, um, it, it, it is correct. The... Um, the, there is a recommendation from Acacia to um, reduce the tree because of the decay in the lower canopy. Um, so the the one report that I have seen doesn't differ enormously from the assessment. It's the recommendation that's slightly different. Um, but if I could just add to that, um, we have received an application to carry out works to a tree that's protected by TPO. It's our um, job to assess whether or not there is sufficient justification for the work that has been proposed. It isn't for us to impose management or recommend management. We have ha we simply have an application and we are determining whether or not there is justification for that work, given that there will be an impact on amenity. And it's the officer's recommendation that the balance on balance, the impact that the work will have on the amenity contribution is outweighed by the potential for damage to occur or damage or harm to occur. Um, I'm sorry, there was another point, but I didn't write it down, Chair. I just thought in the in the debate it might be useful for councillors to understand the, the nature of the pollarding. And I, I yes, height. Seventy percent. Um, yes, I would say that it would be um, you'd be you would be taking um, approximately um, a third, two thirds off the tree. Yeah. Thanks for that, Joanna. I'm sure everyone's here. What Joanna said there. Yeah, so um, let's be clear on that. So the proposal is to defer the item, and that, as I understand it from what Joanna said, although Toby has been slightly contrary on that, is that we would defer the removal of T1, but vote on the uh, crown reduction of T3. Um, I guess we could do an option where we... Yeah, come in, Toby. Sorry, Chair. So I think I put as a badly, badly phrased question, but I, I, I think the answer from Joanna is that you, you can do you can do a split decision, approving or um, refusing um, either part of the application, but a, a kind of split approval or refusal slash deferral. Um, we weren't sure whether whether we were capable legally of doing that. So I. I would suggest it may be safer if we're going down the deferral route, perhaps to defer the entire application rather than part of it and determine the other part. Does that make sense? It does make sense. It seems more straightforward to me as well. Just to check with you, Joanna, there are no implications, are there, in terms of not getting on with the what the applicant wants to do straight away and deferring? Would that be what I mean is refusing the crime reduction on T3? That's that's that can hang that can wait for a bit, can it? Is that okay? Um, oh yes, um, oh, th yes. There's there's no no implication with regards to T T three because we are recommending refusal. So uh, it, yeah, I think it's 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 likely there there would be no implications for um, allowing that to go to appeal. Thank you, um, Sorry, we're getting into such detail here, aren't we? But just to be clear also, so councillors are aware, <clears throat> I started off with liability, I'll end with liability. So if we don't approve the applicant's request to um, for remove T1, and in the interim there is any liability uh, involved, I presume that will fall on us as a council before we consider this deferred, if it's deferred, this deferred item. Although I presume that's not planning matter anyway, is it? Because that's a cost. Am I right in thinking that, Toby? 
understand is that that's correct, Chair. Okay, so I've got myself in a bit of a pickle there because I've started to talk about something which is not relevant, so disregard that. In that if case, I yes, go on, Joanne. Sorry, Chair, if, if I could just say, though, um, because what we are required to do is determine whether or not there is justification, the financial implication is not a planning issue, but the potential loss, the potential damage or harm associated with, with, with a refusal is absolutely the planning decision because that is the justification for the work. Okay. If there was nothing wrong with this tree, we would just say no, recommend refusal. Thank you, that's very clear. Thank you very much, John. So in that case, let's go to that um, proposed deferral. So we have a proposal and a seconder. Um, the proposal is to defer the whole item until we have sight of these reports and they're in public domain and then we can uh, decide on that basis and we can also get um, an updated report from Joanna. So all is in favour of that proposal to defer? Five in favour of deferring. Against? Two against, Chair. So the item is deferred. So obviously we'll get it back to committee as soon as we can. Uh, I can't say at the moment whether it'll be the next committee, but could well be, because I guess there's not much to do except look at those reports and then for you, Joanna, to update your report. Is that correct, Joanna? Well, there was a request for a site visit, so okay. site visits are right. really so quite difficult to, to organise. All right. Okay, well, thank you very much, Joanna. Thank you. Thank and, you. Um, we'll see you again. All right, so that's that then. So the item is deferred, and that is not the last item, is it? Because the next one is the enforcement report. So is everyone okay to carry on? It's not much longer, I don't think. Yeah, okay, so is it just to be noted, is it this one? Is, is anyone going to... I can see John Shuttlewood on screen, so perhaps John wants to say a word or two. Good afternoon, John. Hello, nice to uh, see you. Good afternoon, Chair. Nice to see you too. Good afternoon, everybody. Fire. I don't want Can to... Can you get it closer to your mouth or something? Thank you. I should have remembered that from last month. Is that any better, Chair? That's much better, thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, thank you. I don't want to deprive you, Chair, of you um, uh, going quickly. So I will be brief with my uh, noted report, just to uh, introduce a couple of items that are not on uh, the report. So um, end of July, there are, there are 136 open cases including 61 on regarding short-term lets. In July, uh, 21 new cases were opened and 29 were closed. Uh, in July, two formal enforcement notices were served. One was a breach of condition notice regarding obscure glazing and an address in uh, Newnham Ward. And the other notice was a Section 215 untidy land notice regarding a commercial property, it's a 94 mill road that has extensive fire damage on the front and on the roof at the back. And they're considered to be uh, a, a blight on the residential uh, amenity to the area currently. Uh, updates to service delivery very quickly. Uh, I know I mentioned previously there has been a soft launch on the new ways of uh, reporting alleged breaches of planning control. Uh, on that could be a be done online and there's a lot of information online where residents can see for themselves whether they think it might be a planning breach or not. This may result in a reduction of cases being received going forward so that's going to be noted to see if that has, has any effect on the number of cases being reported. Uh, three posts within the compliance team have been out for recruitment. These are all vacant uh, posts. Uh, pleased to say one senior uh, post has been filled by an officer, Tony Wallace, who has been acting up. Uh, so the team are very pleased for him. Um, we hope that the vacant other senior post and the vacant principal lead officer post will be filled as soon as possible. Uh, regarding the updates, uh, 30 made calls. Why well, I mentioned this at last month's committee. Uh, the applicant has been in touch with regarding uh, how to just to clarify on uh, what is required to comply with the enforcement notice. Uh, Officer Neil Langley is working on that at the moment with the applicant and hopefully that will come to a successful resolution in due course. Uh, eight Kelsey Crescent in Cherry Hinton, that is the subject of an enforcement notice appeal. We're still awaiting the decision from the uh, planning inspectorate. 
Uh, but we don't deal just investigations. We also deal with policy work in the background and the team are working on finalising the draft planning enforcement policy and serving standards, uh, which is being undertaken going forward. So that this is new information. Also, just to let you know, Chair, that the work, work is also taking place to contribute to a council response with regard to the current government consultation and call for evidence with regards to developing a tourist accommodation reg registration scheme in England. That's concerning short term lets and holiday lets. Planning enforcement officers uh, involved with this, along with EHOs and licensing officers, and also the fire brigade as well. Uh, members should have sight of the office response next week uh, before a response needs to be made. Uh, to the call for evidence in two weeks' time. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, John. A couple of bits of good news there, and EHOs are environmental health officers, aren't they? So I can see Councillor Dryden wants to ask about the Cherry Vinson ones, then, Councillor. Of course. Yeah, I did ask last month um, about, uh, I think it was 11 High Street enforcement, and you said that it's in the hands of our solicitors or lawyers. Have you any got any update on that now? It's been going on many three years now. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, yeah, Thank you, Councillor. Uh, no, I don't have any update with you. If I may, if I may, Councillor Dryden, I'd, I'd like to uh, um, um, contact you in the next month regarding that that, um, that case and give you an update personally regarding that. All right. Thank you. Any more? Yeah, Councillor Thornborough. Um, thanks for the report, John. Do you, would you be able to either now or maybe at the next meeting provide a report on the Easy Hotel on Newmarket Road? And then also, um, I'm very interested in the Airbnbs, and I know you've, you've done a, a report here with numbers, but it would be really good to have a bit more understanding about what's happened over the last few years and whether you're under more pressure to deal with an increasing number of Airbnbs and if there's a way that residents and councillors can help um, gain evidence to help you with Airbnbs. And particularly now, I think there could be some um, licensed hotels or uh, bed and breakfast which may be suffering because they're losing business to Airbnbs. Um, so... I'll take the easy hotel report first of all. What I will do, I wouldn't put that into the uh, uh, public domain at such a meeting because obviously anyone can see this live and being recorded, councillors. If I may, I will send you again a private uh, report. I'm quite happily having a private meeting regarding the easy hotel and an update on that. Uh, with regard to the Airbnbs, thank you very much for your continued support. I would say that the numbers that have been reported have, uh, have lessened over the past year or two. That may be the event of COVID, the pandemic, it may be uh, the fact that people decided to have their staycations by the coast rather than the city of Cambridge at the moment. Um, but I do know that the number of reported Airbnbs are actually going up in South Cambridgeshire. So I wonder whether, whether there's any reasons why that's taking place. Uh, moving forward, anyone can uh, respond to the open consultation on the government website. It's 13 questions. Uh, as well as the council response, uh, residents and individuals are free to have a look at the 13 questions online and put in their own responses. Uh, that's 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 quite all right. Thank you. Thanks, John. Um, so just to clarify there, um, Councillor Thornborough is the Executive Councillor for Planning, so it's totally appropriate that he would have a meeting with her to discuss the items that she brought up. Councillor Porra. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'd be very grateful for more information on Airbnb. And I'm assuming, yeah, if, if when you say it's being sent to members, I'm assuming, I don't know whether that's just planning committee or planning and transport or all of us, but I think most ward councillors have an interest in this um, government consultation on short-term let. So if we could have sight of it with some time to respond before, that would be much appreciated. And again, I think we've talked before, Chair, about having a briefing for us on the kind of Airbnb and other provider situation because certainly I get a lot of queries particularly about the smaller units so they're not HMOs it's just where a house has been rented out and is now out of the housing stock because in effect it's become a holiday let with the comings and goings and it's quite difficult at the moment with national policy to work out how best to advise 
um, residents. So I think we'd be really grateful for that. And I think after the pandemic, this will become more of a problem. So if we could perhaps have a briefing session on that sooner rather than later, I'd really appreciate it. Thank you, and congratulations. Glad you're getting your post filled. That's great. Thank you, Councillor Noting. So, John, did you want to reply to any of that? Um, no, Councillor Pora, thank you very much for your support. Uh, I know having spoken to our colleagues in licensing and uh, the, um, they are rather the concern that there seems to be a new proliferation where there is some kind of mixed use of dwellings where there seems to be a mix between HMOs or large HMOs with some short st short term lettings and Airbnb with them. So I think that's, you know, the general standard of housing and accommodation in these individual properties are not built or not suitable for such use. Uh, I think that's increasing in numbers and uh, I think, you know, well, you know, from a licensing issue, it's rather this consultation comes, doesn't come from the Department of Levelling Up or a Department for the Government, local government and communities. It actually comes from the uh, kind of a tourist angle and it's looking at basically, you know, saying how can we do it in terms of holiday lets? Well, I don't think that, my personal opinion, that doesn't cover the whole gamut of issues regarding short term lets. And then, as you say, I do think that, you know, it does involve taking out housing. Uh, permanent housing out of the permanent housing market stock and we are very fortunate to have such a policy in the Cambridge city I believe that addresses the issue of loss of permanent residential uh, dwellings in the city. Thank you. Thanks John. Yeah, uh, Councillor Bennett. Two very quick points. First is that if there's a briefing on Airbnb and short-term lets I would suggest making it an all councillor briefing because there's so many ward work problems from this. And as you said, it cuts across licensing, housing and planning. So that's already quite a lot of councillors. And it seems unfair to leave a few remaining ones out. And my second one is I did take advantage of John's offer after the last meeting to have a private meeting about Easy Hotel. And I'd be very happy to pass the contents on to anybody out after the formal closes this meeting. Thank you, Councillor. Um, so I think as far as I understand, any any um, briefing or training that councillors in planning have is, is open to any councillor in, 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 this, in this council, as far as I know. Um, yeah, John, did you want to respond to any of that? Um, yeah, I want to say thank you very much, Chair. I'll say finally is that I believe that probably the report will be going for the site of executive respective executive councillors and they can choose whether they want to involve other members themselves. I am quite happy. Uh, I have to, spot, uh, to get permission to once I have a copy of our response, I'm happy to then set forward it onto members of the committee who wish to see it. Thanks, John. No more. That's it then. Well done. Thanks very much, John. Excellent. Good work. I'm glad we've got somebody else to work with you and we need more people, don't you, working in enforcement and we can get more enforcement done. So good. Thank you. All right. Have a nice rest of the afternoon then. So I think we're all done now for planning. Oh, there's one more. Oh, I'm sorry, John. That's it. Yeah. So we're all done. So if you can take us offline then, please, Chris. Are we offline?